Um, thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, I'm Phil Jones, and I'm sort of representing the organising committee this morning. Um, a, a fine band of thieves and rogues who have uh, come together to organise what is the third of our annual Digital Geographies Research Group uh, Symposium. Um, now, Dorothea is somewhere. Um, no, Dorothea is not somewhere. <laughs> Dorothea has wandered off. Um, Dorothea is the chair of the Digital Geographies Research Group. We're the newest research group of the uh, Royal Geographical Society. Uh, we got our research group status last year. Uh, it's open to all. If you're already a member of the RGS, uh, just tick the box um, in the subscription form. Uh, if you aren't a member of the RGS but would like to join, uh, then we have uh, details on our website about how to uh, pay your nominal fee of five pounds a year to become a member of the group. Uh, we have obviously our annual symposium. We have a uh, sponsorship of conference sessions, and we have a whole slew of really exciting conference sessions coming up at this year's uh, RGS conference. Um, we also have our AGM there, so if anybody wants to come and uh, come along and join the committee, that's always uh, a welcome, a welcome thing. Um, we're also going to be hopefully, fingers crossed, starting an undergraduate dissertation prize in next year's round. Um, so if people want to join the, uh, the prize judging committee for that, again, volunteers always welcome. There's details of because <laughs> he's just three volunteers. Um, Details uh, of digitalrgs.org or just drop, drop a email. Uh, tweeting today, uh, digitalrgs, and the hashtag we've been using is um, dgrg19 uh, for today's event. Uh, and Hannah, who has been doing sterling work, Hannah Rebecca, who has been doing sterling work on the organisational side, is going to be uh, handing out an evaluation form at the end of the day. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, the first thing is that we're filming and indeed streaming today. Um, if you are sitting on this side of the room, then you're not in the stream. In, and if you're sitting in the back of the other room, then you're not in the stream. Uh, if you uh, don't want your talk filmed, let us know before you give your talk and we'll hit pause. Uh, we're not expecting any fire alarms this morning, so if there are any alarms, um, and they did test them earlier and they do seem to be working, so if there are any alarms, um, the emergency exits are the way that you came in, uh, the, the sort of front stairs, and if those are blocked for any reason, then you head down this corridor and there's a back set of stairs you can go down there. Um, toilets on this corridor and on the top of the stairs where we came in, they're only little, um, so if you're desperate and there is a queue, uh, the ground floor opposite the breakfast bar, uh, there's a very large uh, set of bathrooms down there. Lunch is booked for 12.45. Um, I've booked a kind of mix of uh, vegan and uh, non-vegan options. If you can't find anything you like, give us a shout. There's cats and whatnot all around campus, so um, you can uh, hopefully be able to find something that suits your, your tastes. If those of you who are able to stick around, uh, we will go down to the ground floor of this building where we have the Bradley Bar for a drink after the symposium, if well, people want to. Uh, when sort of pitched the idea for a kind of gaming workshop for this year's symposium, uh, one of the sort of brutal reasons was the kind of, oh, there's Dorothea, our president. So if you want to talk um, <laughs> about the Digital Geographies uh, Research Group, grab Dorothea in, in the lunch break. Um, sort of brute economic uh, value to sector. I, I love doing stuff like this where you go, okay, so you know the estimated value of the sector is about 137, 138 billion uh, last year. Which you know our two oldest industrial sectors, our two large oldest economic sectors, uh, agriculture and construction. Well, it's a sizable portion of those two sectors uh, in terms of its value. So gaming is, is a big deal. It's not kids stuff, um, although obviously some of it is. But it, it's actually worth a hell of a lot of money. And so sort of dismiss it as oh it's niche, it's not. It's a hugely important thing, if for no other reason than the sheer amount of money that's involved. But also there's the, the social and cultural implications. And one of the things which has been, I found really interesting more recently getting into uh, gaming stuff, is there's scholarship in games it's for donkey years. And that's a shock to me, coming to this new. Um, and as the kind of piece of game studies, the journals launched, talking about, you know, this is representing a, an interdisciplinary research area, it's emerging, it's exciting, it's dynamic, and fast forward to the kind of last couple of years. And it's no longer so emerging. And it's been this sort of weird irony that instead of it just being that game studies has been the place for interdisciplinary collaboration, that disciplines themselves have started to take gaming in, uh, seriously. And so there's been a bit of a retreat to the disciplines to actually study these things. 
Uh, that being said, really healthy interest in geography. Obviously, for years we've known about James Ash's work. Um, lots of other people have been doing games as a bit of a sideline. And what's been really exciting in the last few years is that a collection of really exciting early career stars have been pushing this agenda forward hard. And a lot of them spoke out in the room today, so we're hearing from some of those uh, guys later on. That being said, still much for us to learn as geographers from other disciplines. And we've got a very interdisciplinary group of people here today, which I'm really excited about. Um, one of the things, uh, as, as, so as a geographer coming late into looking at games, that I found really interesting is that game studies as a sort of interdisciplinary discipline has not considered space terribly well. And I think that's a big gap for geographers to, to fill in that area. So we picked a, a bunch of different themes for today um, when we are advertising it. Some things around gaming landscapes, which is which particularly of interest to me, so it gets top in. So. Um, but there's lots of really exciting things that gaming throws up. That when we were kicking around ideas for this workshop, these are the kind of things we said, this is what we'd like papers to be about. And I think we've covered most of these themes with the different papers and workshops that we've got on today. Uh, issues around immersion, issues around methodologies, the sort of toxicity and identity, and even to the more you know, uh, philosophical issues, uh, extension ludology and post phenomenology, which uh, Peter's GMOD workshop this afternoon is going to cover in some depth. Uh, I'm also very excited about the three keynotes that we've got today. Um, first up, in just a moment, I'll hand over to uh, Sarah Jones, who is head of uh, the School of Media at BCU. Uh, just down the way from Sarah's had a, a fascinating career, um, of which she, I'm sure she will say more about, uh, including doing uh, 360 content and other things for ITM News before moving into the academic sector. Um, but her work on, on story living, her presence manifests itself in an immersive media, again, we shall hear about very shortly. Uh, John Sear, hopefully, will turn up shortly. I can't see him yet, but I'm sure he'll be here on time. Uh, John uh, is somebody I've worked with uh, on a couple of projects. A uh, software developer, used to work for Codemasters, but he's been doing some really interesting work for his firm, uh, Museum Games, where he's doing much more interactive experiences. So it's about public engagement with gaming technologies very large scale things, cross city, theatre involved work as well. Um, and then our sort of afternoon keynote after lunch is Melissa Kagan uh, from, from Bango to come across and she's going to do some really, really cool paper looking at the way that we can uh, hack identities through counterplay. Um, so in terms of the schedule today, just to make things slightly complicated, we have uh, parallel paper sessions at 11 o'clock. Um, and what we'll do after um, Sarah's opening keynote is take a bit of a vote um, because we have a, this room and we have a, a smaller room. Um, and if there's a big disparity between the, the you know, people wanting to go to each session, we'll put the smaller session in the smaller room. Um, so we'll take a vote, as I say, just before 11 o'clock. Um, otherwise, uh, yes, John's keynote will be at 12.15, we've got lunch at 12.45, and then uh, we have digital shorts in the afternoon, which is our opportunity for people who just want to kick an idea around uh, for a couple of minutes, uh, which is something we've done in the last couple of workshops uh, here with digital geographies, and it seems to work quite well as an opportunity to just pitch a few ideas through. Um, we've also got some workshop sessions in the afternoon, and again, uh, we've got uh, parallel sessions here, so we have uh, the uh, Gary's Mod workshop, which is the one which is guaranteed to go wrong. Um, <laughs> being run from Sydney, so we'll see how that works. Um, Gary's Mod Workshop and the Walking Simulator Workshop, so choose between those two. And then after tea, uh, we've got the Lipcraft Workshop um, and uh, the sort of Experiencing VR Workshop before our closing panel at 4 o'clock. So that's the schedule for today. I'm going to be running around today looking stressed and worried. Um, but I'm going to uh, hand over now to uh, Sona, who is our first keynote speaker. Um, who uh, I'm very delighted to welcome to Berlin. So thank you, everyone. I'm also in one of those running around looking stressed moments. It's NSS results day today, um, which means everything to me. So 
So it's one of those um, slightly manic days where people are taking numbers and goodness knows what else. Agency. Um, agency as we become a culture more concerned with interactivity. 
and the importance of agency for immersion within an experience was also cited by Brown and Kearns in 2003. And they defined immersion within games on three levels, engagement, engrossment, and total immersion. And some of the more established work on immersion within media practice comes from Dan Murray, another phenomenal mind, um, emphasizing immersion as a participatory activity. So we see the same feeling from a psychologically immersive experience that we do from a plunge in the ocean or a swimming pool. The sensation of being surrounded by a completely other reality, or as different as water is from air, that takes over all of our attention, our whole perceptual apparatus. For Murray, it's the complexity of the world in cyberspace that allows for immersion in new media forms. But presence is distinct. Yes, it has that agency, it has that interactivity, as cited, but there's a deeper level that needs to be understood. There's multiple definitions of what this is. And this is where we get to the really exciting part about it being an interdisciplinary subject. Because there are lots of different definitions. We can go back to the um, original concepts of telepresence and look at people like Sturrow in the 90s, defining this as when the virtual experience dominates being in the real world. The technology that's used produces the experience of being in an environment rather than what's around you. Or Loomis arguing the presence entails some emotional involvement. It's about that connection to the subject. And it's related to different levels of realism. <coughs> Lombard, who's written a lot around presence and the experience of being in virtual worlds, noted it's achieved when tasks are performed in a virtual environment as if they were in a real environment. And what's interesting, if you put a headset on, on a, a younger person, obviously within the health and safety guidelines, um, you can see them responding in the headset in the way that they would in the real world. I put a six-year-old inside an ocean reef diving experience, and within a minute they started using their hands as if they were swimming in an, emo in, in an ocean. A natural response to being in the environment. And then what Lombard would define as presence. There's work cited which defines media presence or inner presence, which we all come on to. Media presence has been the perceptual illusion of non-mediation, where that technology is disappearing from your consciousness, where you're no longer aware of being in a technological space. And inner presence as being more of a neuro neuropsychological phenomenon, evolved from the interplay of our biological and cultural inheritance, where the goal is the control of the human activity. Saker, talking to it as a suspension of disbelief, something that will come up time and time again, and Ryan Gold calling it a form of antibody experience. But the problem we have is that interdisciplinarity around virtual reality, immersive media. And it's a problem that nobody can agree on a definition or a way of understanding it. Min in 2014 was noting the difficulties in this, saying it's just down to so many different fields of studies, usually with different terminology. And the lack of research on understanding how a virtual experience differs to a human experience and that ambiguity over different types of presence, whether it's physical, social, or the self. So as a working definition, I try and keep things simple. I don't want to overcomplicate things. I go back to the 90s and all those minds I love so much. And I use the understanding of presence from Pimento and Cesaria, where the question isn't whether the creative world is as real as the physical world, but whether the creative world is real enough for you to suspend your disbelief. So it's our language of, of Slater again, suspending disbelief in the world. And then the illusion that the mediated experience is not mediated. So for a moment, we lose ourselves in that experience and we're not aware that technology is driving it. It is subjective, it is experiential, and immersion is possible in other forms, art, opera, theatre, where it's present where you fully give yourself to another reality and that's the goal for immersive media. So then how can we achieve it through the lived story? So within my work, I look at Heim's essence of the technology, as I mentioned, and those cyberdelic experiences. Barlow in 1990 wrote this incredible article in one of the magazines around a virtual reality of an art form. And I interrogate these ideas in practice. Within these experiences, how we gain presence and create that idea of lucid dreaming by not being tied to a directed narrative is explored. I am largely influenced by the work of Lanier with the objective to find this fictitious planet with new continents you can dive into to find new realities. As he said, it's been a while 
libraries or cut off. I'll put them online so that later. Um, the thing that's remarkably beautiful to me about virtual reality is that you can make up reality in virtual reality and share it with other people. And that idea is something that just explores um, the creativity with so many people. By focusing on this, we can forget about the technology and understand the phenomenological reasoning around experience. If you look back to Heidegger, who began to explore humanity's relationship with technology as something um, that is experienced when it's able to freely develop, freely explore, to develop a true sense of meaning. With Merleau-Ponty, um, analyzing where our philosophy is developed by the experience of bringing truth into being. This is just random work, I just can't scream. This approach seeks to articulate the essence of the technology, which has helped to gain much deeper perspectives of immersive media <coughs> as the technology advances and develops. Crucial to his thinking, Heidegger explains that the essence of technology is nothing technological. We want to forget about the actual technology and understand what we see when we let it go. Same as asked to return to the beginning before technological advances, the technology does not make sense in itself. We need to understand what the technology is revealing to us or disclosing to us to fully understand its meaning and place in society. Within virtual reality, we can start applying these terms to the practice of storytelling and understand how the new forms of technology are permitting emerging story forms, along with new patterns of experience in the world and the stories it has to tell. And a simple example of this is in Tree Hugger. Has anyone experienced Tree Hugger? Yeah, absolutely amazing, right? The Marshmallow Laser Feast, um, an extraordinary digital art organisation, they created a Tree Hugger. And the viewer steps inside the trunk of a tree and experiences its anatomy from within. And look around and see this completely different viewpoint of what it's like to be inside the tree. The experience from within that is no less real or truthful from the view that we have when looking upon the tree, but it adds a different layer of reality to our comprehension of what the tree entails. And it's at this deeper level that what emerges is story living. The technology permits a change in the concept of how we understand media and a move from an approach led by storytelling to one that's rooted in experience. Story living is a distinguishing feature and a new field of study. Now, the concept of the lived story has been the subject of interdisciplinary research around cultures and experiences, looking at how we can bring about transformations in understanding around different disciplines. It's also something that's been catching on within industry publications. Since 2017, industry um, has been defining immersive storytelling as story living. Aside from the practice of immersive media, it's growing as terminology within cultural and commercial circles. Oh, I was going to get back there. So you've got the drum saying the brands need to do more than just tell a story, they need to live them. It's that idea that we're now a culture of interactivity and we're a culture that's focused on experience. Camille Colucci, who's head of the, the Void, a huge immersive studio, there's what we're moving into in this new world of story living. We're creating spaces and worlds where people have the chance to live out their own stories within a framework that we design. Mathieu and Bowman argue that the distinctive nature um, of story living um, is when, in the virtual reality from the story, is when the audience's living stories are being told as opposed to being told it. Through an approach of story living, it expands perspectives, and the audience are left with a powerful emotional experience. It's one of my experiences, um, I did a random post-Brexit thing. <coughs> um, which was set in Western, Western voted in exactly the same proportions as the UK um, for Brexit. Um, so the whole experience is reminiscent of British culture. And they evoked an emotional response to the country that's divided post-Brexit. There isn't a set narrative. There isn't a directed narrative. It's about the exploration of the place. It's about the exploration of the space. Understanding what's happening in the sound. All the sounds are created, obviously, from the space. But you get to explore what's going on and identify with the characters that you've come across. 
Also critical to the understanding of story living, where the non-directed narrative allows audiences to take away different experiences, is Walser's idea of the space maker. So Walser argued um, that we need to think of ourselves as magicians. And we think that's a really exciting way to kind of define yourself. I am a magician. I'm creating these realities. We wanted you to think of yourself as a magician that creates a cyberspace where different realities can emerge. So within this, this film is one of the ones I have shot in Hong Kong, where I was kind of exploring those ideas of place and space. And I was capturing this environment and the people that were in there, um, and different, amount, different narratives were emerging. So everybody that's watched that experience has come away with a different narrative. It's not directed, I'm setting up an environment, and I'm letting different realities emerge. The audience developed that those different narrative ideas around the juxtaposition of cultures, how communities are formed and merge, and that's a direct response to being able to create a space for living and experience. And so in all these images um, that follow, where you can see evidence of that, how I embed it into practice, the vast, diverse, that's really badly done. I just screenshot quickly last night. Um, the vast and diverse environments that are portrayed open to a number of different interpretations and the reality that's formed by the audience is one that develops on their own experience. That's a bit better. Um, so that's a ghost town in Texas that's just been left like that. Um, you can see where the image would be wrapped around if it was in a headset. Um, fascinating place. Um, a ghost town in Texas just off Route 66. Um, but you see that environment filled, you, you see the, the, the vastness of the secluded environment. You can see how in that moment you are exploring and coming up with your own ideas of what happens. We experience things in different ways. So that's why we cannot direct a, a narrative if we're focusing on an experiential medium. Despite appearing deserted, it's realities that emerge on how places have changed. Questions around whether it's always been like this or whether it was a reflection on a change in time. The experience all depends on the audience's understanding on the experience as a whole. So identifying story living as critical to presence within immersive media builds on those ideas um, that were presented to us by Heidegger, McLuhan, and Hume, influencing phenomenological thought within new technology. Coined and picked it up in the 90s, connecting those ideas the new realities and worlds unfold within virtual reality. By taking this approach, we value the technology in a new way. It's not bound or limited by previous constraints of what it is. And I really like the idea, as much as I like the magician line, I like the idea that using VR is not operating puppets. I really like that idea that we're not constrained. We're not constraining the audience by screens we can achieve something other than entertainment. Just because it's an experience you might put on in a headset doesn't mean it has to just be entertainment. Puppets can change identity and become the people operating them. And through recognising the differences of coin argues, we can discover Heidegger's disclosure and find new metaphors within the technology. This application is focused on VR within the early 90s. I don't tend to do computer-generated worlds. I tend to use film create experiences, and there might be some questions on that afterwards. Um, but applying it within broad immersive media, we can see those new practices emerging that are not bound by established restrictions or practices. And this is really evident when you start doing non-directed narratives. It's a bit like the interactive docs movement has been huge out down in Bristol, um, where you have that freedom within the narrative. The audience is responsible for their experience, not within the constraints of the technology and the world's created for them to explore. Last year I did a, a big report for, for Google two years ago where he, he wrote about story living, but it's when the user embodies a virtual character, explores the space, and makes sense of their own experience. If we go back to one of the original questions I posed from Heinz seminal work on metaphysics of virtual reality in 1994, the question, what is the essence of the technology, and the inner spirit, the cultural motor, um, we can start seeing the technology Broadly, to embrace the concept of immersive media, the answer lies within story living, realised when we feel presence in the virtual experience. 
and it's a presence that gains a deeper understanding and new perspectives that is the essence of virtual reality. And this is what Mang refers to as the cultural motor that propels the technology. So to sum up, the, the aim today is to introduce our concept of story living, what I argue is the defining form of immersive media. And this is achieved when we get a sense of presence. I define presence as being an essential component of immersive media, something distinct that distinguishes it from other media forms. We have to continue to take on that playful, explorative approach to understanding the potentiality of the media, not relying solely on virtual reality, but also the influence of augmented reality and holograms to explore ideas of presence and interactions with different technological forms. In early studies on, on VR, Mental and Textile encouraged the use of VR as a form of art, where artists through simulation will merge together all art forms into something new. Virtual reality, or immersive media, is about an experience. It is an experiential media. And this is why we need an approach that isn't about telling someone something. The relationship changes, we live the experience, therefore it's story living that's key to define the practice. As a warning, I end up with another fangirl <laughs> moment, John Mallier. I have to start and end with him every time. And a warning to not lose yourself in the thrill of the content. And the question that remains prominent at the end of this is what happened to the dream of improvising reality, shared lucid dreaming, I mean, what's the point of just making a flashy type of movie or video game? Thank you. He's a great guy. <laughs> You are not a gadget, throw away your social media, dawn of the new everything. Um, oh. <laughs> you don't write his album page. Yeah, I, I, I think he's an incredible mind. He was also in The Great Compared. Hmm? He was also uh, a songwriter for The Great Compared. Yeah, he plays like 200 musical instruments. <laughs> he's a genius. <laughs> So thank you very much. So, I, I imagine there are an awful lot of questions. Uh, does anyone want to kick off? Yes. I have a question about Marx. Okay, so why is it a good thing to fall completely into an immersive virtual reality and thus erase the means of production? Why, when you know we have this early 20th century Brechtian intervention in precisely this idea that you shouldn't be so defamiliarized that you lose sight of the labor politics involved? Um, I, I was drawn to that example you had of the Brexit town. That it's like, well, you know, this this sort of isn't political. It's like uh, it's it's about this town where
think you need to take on a character to do that? No. I, I don't think you need to on the basis that most of my work you don't. Um, and there's there's no difference to um, the, the sense of presence. Um, so, so no. I think you can have interesting results when you do. Um, and there's been some great work um, out of Stanford from the Human Interaction Lab where changing identities, and Mel Sage has done a lot on this as well, where you, know, you can look in a mirror in a headset and change your identity to become um, a woman and understand what it's like to be a female in the workplace. Um, or you can understand what it's like to be homeless. Um, so there's certainly a lot of embodying characters to, to help understand different perspectives, um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, I don't think it's necessary for story living. And, and how I always think of it, if, if I'm filming something, the camera is that person. So you are that, that person. In a headset, I know that this is from my point of view and from my perspective looking around and I am the camera. Um, so I don't think it's necessary. I, I don't need to look down and see blue hands to know that my hands are there. Um, and the technology that I deal with isn't good enough yet. I don't like feeling like a cartoon. Um, I prefer to just accept, okay, I can't see my body, but in 30 seconds I've lost that and I don't need it. Um, so I think it can be interesting and it can help understand things, but I don't think it's necessary. It feels like you encapsulated it when you talked about inhabiting a point of view. That's what it is, it's inhabiting a point of view. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I talk a lot um, around the really flawed notion of empathy and that we are as an empathy machine, um, and I don't like it. Um, and I, I struggle with that idea of, you know, I can put on a headset and um, feel like um, I'm a refugee and I'm struggling. Um, and so no, you can't, you can only feel like it's for you to understand what it's like to be a refugee. You don't have that, that historical context to really understand it. Just putting on a headset and pretending that you're there isn't going to give you that, that context at all. Um, so I think that's a really flawed idea. But I get shouted at a lot. I think that's probably a good place to Thank you. Thank you. just try and sort of smash this out in 15 minutes anyway. Uh, so basically, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, it started off as some research I was doing on sort of side research on cities. Um, I ended up on Roblox, which I'll explain um, in a moment, but the research hasn't progressed quite as I imagined because I was hoping to play with my niece and her friends in Roblox, and it turns out that actually two of them are really disagreeable. Um, so most of the time it was just me by myself in Roblox, which is slightly creepy because it's mostly full of children and also you just don't learn much if you're not playing with people, right? So I needed um, networks of people playing with and adults don't enjoy it. So just as a kind of caveat, uh, this is a work in progress. Okay. Uh, so part of what I'm interested in doing, um, building on, I think quite a lot of people will be talking about um, of really specific examples, things they've worked on, so I'm sort of a little bit more on the um, theory of space and place and landscape uh, in terms of digital media. Uh, so I have sort of identified that typically, and I am generalising here, there are two common ways to consider space and place in digital media. Um, so one sort of default is the idea of an online space, so sort of the idea of a cyberspace. Uh, involving communities and groups of individuals, networks, screens and hardware, and it's sort of broadly um, this kind of idea. Started off with chat rooms and you progress from there. And the other is the digital virtual space, so something that's fictional or imagined, um, so typically 3D game worlds, sometimes narratives, um, the ideas of sort of diagenic or narrative space of games, right? So there's this um, generalisation that happens. Um, and I'm sort of trying to problematise this. I think increasingly they're kind of interlinked. There's a lot of blurring between the two. Um, and so when you start to look at things like this is Harry Potter Wizards Unite, 
um, Pokemon Go, that kind of stuff, you increasingly get a blur between kind of a virtual community um, and a virtual space. Um, and I'm also interested in things like speculative 3D models for planned future developments and that kind of thing as well. Um, so I think these really merge these two ideas together. Um, so if we're thinking about definitions of space and place, it straight away gets quite complicated. Uh, so, you know, can we have digital places? And we have a lot of arguments in favour of both. You know, it's not fundamentally physically real, therefore it's not a place. Um, and then also the question of how is space, including, you know, Lefebvrean or Marxist notions of production and consumption and experience, are uh, impacted by digital media. You know, and is this impact in some way different from, say, the impacts of capitalism more broadly or not? Uh, so Dorian Massey clearly understood the digital world to be spatial. Um, so, you know, it's embedded in real material practices and she was clear that the world of physical space and the world of electronically mediated connections do not exist as somehow separate layers. The virtual world, and that's her own sort of inverted commas as well there, this virtual world depends on and further configures the multiplicities of physical space. So if we're looking for a theorization of space, Dorian Massey, you know, not going to argue with her, says, well, look, you know, it's a kind of configuration that works within the social space um, and the physical space that we already have. Um, so we sort of end up straight away with this problem, which I would say is maybe a fake problem, um, of the virtual and the real. Uh, and I really love to go back to Setlana Boeing's work um, from the future of nostalgia, where she was really very critical early on of this idea of cyberspace. So she says, our internet patriots would claim that cyberspace unfolds in another dimension beyond the rules of existential mathematics and the dialectic of memory and forgetting. Cyberspace makes the bric a brac of nostalgia available in digital form, appearing more desirable than the real artifacts. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of other things that she sort of says about this. I don't have time to expand. If you haven't looked at uh, Future of Nostalgia, I really recommend having a, having a look at that. Um, but key amongst it, I can get to my slide, um, is that she sort of starts to talk about things like Bergson's, Bergson's theory of consciousness. She talks about hypertext. Uh, and she basically says that um, the new media redefines the architecture of space with a superhighway, villages and chat rooms, but then goes on to say, but none of it's particularly new, actually. These are variations of the spaces that we have. So these metaphors for the novelty of space are really just, uh, you know, ways of uh, expressing capitalist desire. And she was sort of talking about this in the 90s. Um, and I just got a little picture here from an from a AR game called Wayfinder Live. Um, so then I think we immediately get to this question, which, I, which may have been um, what, what was posed uh, at the end of the last session, uh, or the last paper as well, with the questions. Um, but actually, are we really getting digital places, spaces, um, or is this just about consumption? So Julian Stalagrass actually wrote about games and said, um, was really critical about the potential for games as being kinds of spaces and being complex, saying that really they were just open to commodification. He says, like cast metal sculptures, virtual objects are hollow. Code like air fills their voids, their surfaces being a reflective chrome. They are mirror images of undifferentiated, mass-produced consumer goods. Games obsequiously reflect the operation of consumer capital being based on exchange, the trading of money, munitions or energy, the shuttling back and forth of goods and blows. And I think what's interesting about this is, on one hand, it problematizes the idea that you could have what we might call an authentic or genuine place, uh, but at the same time, when you think about the production of place and space, it also hints towards this kind of um, all-consuming drive of capitalism in particular to overtake all space and place and experience anyway, right? So these might actually be uh, mutually constituted. Uh, and so we can start to talk about, um, on one hand, um, I'm interested in the description of space and place in games through navigation. I think that's a really important uh, definition if you're trying to think about how is something maybe a place, how is something a space. Navigation is a key part of that. Um, but also I think it, it's a bit lazy of me, but it's quite straightforward to actually say, yeah, it's a place because it's produced, uh, according to Henri Lefebvre, abstract space is a representation of space that is shallow. It contains specific imaginary elements, fantasy images, symbols which appear to arise from something else, but such representations find their authority and prescriptive power in and through space that underpins them and makes them effective. So he sort of says that yes, you know, we have lived material spaces, but they are constituted from kind of underlying symbolic um, prescriptions of space. Uh, so I'm actually going to skip this bit because I'm running out of time, but basically this is an argument that we need to understand representation, um, which follows on from the Fed. Uh, 
Uh, and then I think the other thing that's quite important before we get onto the Roblox example um, is to think about landscape as well. So that landscape is this way of kind of situating people within the environment. Um, it's used very neatly in a lot of games as almost a shortcut to kind of situate people within specific locations, um, particularly if you want to say, okay, I'm in this particular city. Uh, so Port and Calais kind of contrasts the simulation of space with the representation of landscape. So he sort of says that navigable space is necessarily simulated space. Uh, but I think we need to remember to go back to some of the landscape theory that Sharon Zukin actually says that landscape itself stretches the imagination. It's more than a descriptor for the physical setting, topography or scenery. It also refers to the ensemble of material and social practice and their symbolic representation. So again, we're kind of going back to the idea from the Feathered Well and the slide that I skipped um, that representational kind of elements do structure space and place and experiences of space and place. Um, and I'm quite willing to have a, a fight about that with anyone who wants to. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I'm quite happy. Um, so Roblox is this really strange, has anyone played Roblox in any great detail? It's really weird. Um, so basically, it's an online gaming and social media platform, but it's really for kids, so most of the people on there are kind of under 14. Um, and if you go in, it's a series of places that you can kind of log into, um, and a lot of it's kind of role-playing games with various kinds of structures. And I mean role-playing games in the way that kids in the playground say they're going to play families or they're going to play Let's Cook or whatever, you know, these kinds of games. Um, and it's huge. It's, it's growing really quickly. So in less than a year, it went from 80 to 90 million active users in the last sort of 18 months. Um, it's, it's still going up. And so it does a lot of different things. So it's kind of a social network. It's kind of a space for games. But it's also, you know, a lot of kids logging into the same location all the time and running around. So there are playgrounds, for example, where kids will log on every day and hang out together in these playgrounds. It's a really weird environment. Um, and if you're interested, this is the spiel that they have about their own, um, their own software. So then they have these things that are places, so you can kind of see Jailbreak, Mad City, Dungeon Quest. So they're kind of games, um, but they're also kind of locations. Um, they also provide a studio to design and model content, which is kind of their shtick that, you know, um, people can go in and make their own places. So Bloxburg is a user-generated place, right, in their own language. Um, so basically, my early observations on this uh, are that Roblox, um, they use abstract representations of place and landscape through things to produce a kind of social space. This is the argument that I would make. Um, it is highly capitalist, so you can see here, you need 399 more Robux before you can do whatever it is that I was trying to do there. Um, it amalgamates cyberspace and virtual space, I would say, um, and it's also really social and community oriented. So if you, again, you get the same users logging into the same places. Um, and it has really strong links to urban city design, which I'll talk about for a couple of minutes um, towards the end, particularly in the way that places, so games, worlds, bases, all of these locations that are built by users and then have them are actually represented as part of cities. Um, so there are often these very urban kind of themes and users as citizens of the urban or suburban space of Robloxia. So this is a user-generated image of this place that is Robloxia that is also a place that you can go to and there's an infinitude of Robloxia imagined um, places that users have put together um, that sort of imagine this city that you might all be living in. So that's kind of, I'll come back to Roblox in a minute. Um, I sort of wanted to talk a bit about um, AR and VR, but I don't have a lot of time for that. I mean. And also, this is more of a history of where Roblox kind of came from as well. So some of this stuff is really old. Um, Arab's been doing sort of 3D modeling, for example, um, to understand things like passenger movements through train stations. And a lot of this was going on at the same time as Roblox. And what sort of happened is that you now have this um, kind of conversion between architectural modeling and games, which I think most of you would probably be familiar with. Uh, I've just got a kind of neat quote here from a guy from Blockworks. So that's, a, that's the VNA model that Blockworks made, that they basically go into Minecraft and do architectural models in Minecraft and they're all architects. So um, the guy who runs that says, whilst the architects of today grew up playing with Lego, I've no doubt the next generation will play Minecraft. People have to stop thinking of it as a game. It's a CAD tool. And as such, it's the most widely used one in the world. Um, and they're sort of looking to bridge the gaps between design and reality, which I'm like, well, the point of design is that it produces reality, I would have thought. But anyway, um, so... Um, I don't have time to go through this sort of participatory planning stuff, but if you're interested and you don't already know, just have
had a look at the MIT Media Lab stuff. They do a lot of interactive design um, using hybrid reality labs to actually produce urban spaces. Um, so the most probably well-known one um, was that they helped to design refugee housing in Hamburg in 2016, and that's a picture of the kind of half material, half virtual um, that they use. Um, so just to finish up, I wanted to kind of point out, though, that a lot of the hype around this digital AR, VR kind of stuff uh, is not new, uh, and it is hype. And I would point to um, the work of um, Melbourne's Megan and Rose, uh, who worked on CGI in Doha and said that CGI is not simply then the product of certain social conditions but constitute an inscription of individual and collective identities, knowledge and values, allow for the inscription of actors in common venture and lead to the objectification of a, pro of, of, of a project in real life. In that sense, CGI, so computer generated images, are not only representations but actually have agency and become embedded in the construction of space, place and social life, which I feel like should seem fairly logical but we're still here having these discussions. Um, it's not just me, it's other people. And I would also want to quickly point out um, that a lot of this stuff we do still need to be skeptical of. Uh, so there's this hilarious augmented, augmented reality app um, from Philroy and Bosch where you can augment reality your, your bathroom. However, I would point out that yes, you download the app and then the next step is to download the AR marker and print it and then stick it up in your bathroom. So sort of like, to what extent is this really a digital kind of experience? Um, so we really need to be skeptical on a lot of this stuff. It's done in kind of um, for the buzz, I think. Uh, so to conclude, um, and these are just wild conclusions that I'm making, partly as well, so people can disagree with me. Um, so space, place, and associated landscapes and material encounters exist in digital media. I'm just saying they do, right? Um, and they generate new senses space and place beyond the digital. Um, and we know that they're used as tools for this purpose. That's kind of the point of someone like MIT working on these digital hybrid reality labs. Uh, representation against perhaps popular, particularly geographical uh, ideas is a key aspect of the capacity of digital media to actually produce space um, in the Lefebvrean sense. So particularly when we're thinking about consumption and things like that, and maybe in Marx's perspective, any separation of cyberspace communities, virtual spaces or worlds, and material or, quote, real space is difficult to maintain in the face of hybrid media and hybrid social worlds. So Roblox really troubled this idea because it's both a virtual um, sort of space uh, and a cyberspace, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and also none of these claims are new. So Boyan, Massey, and Melvish, lots of others have actually had this argument in various ways before, but somehow we always come back to this debate. We can't kind of decide is the virtual, you know, real or not? Like, we just need to make this decision and say, well, you know, it's much more complicated than that. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, what we're going to do is just go through the papers one after the other, and then have as much time as we've got left um, at the end for questions. Um, morning, everyone. Um, I have to make an apology first of all to Nick. I can't make it. Um, his son's not very well, unfortunately, so he couldn't come over from Poland. Um, this is a shame because we're talking about place building in VR and VR games, and Nicole's a geographer, and I'm a charlatan. Um, so I'm a media theorist who's hung around geography for a long, long time, pretending to know what he's talking about. Um, Nicole couldn't hang on with me. He stuck with me instead. This is a very, very basic outline of some ideas we were pulling together when I spent some time with Nicole in April on an Erasmus Plus exchange in Agnes Gillis University. As we were sitting having a coffee and a cigarette one day outside the building, Nicole was asking me about what video games I play. And I was reading off this endless list of things I used to distract myself from the horrific everyday life that I have as a senior lecturer at Swampy University. And we got onto VR games, and I said, sort of started reading off some of the games that I've actually played with them. He said, okay, so you've got two categories of games. There were games that were made for VR and games that weren't made for VR. What do you find you prefer? And I thought about this question previously, and not really given it a huge amount of thought, and we've sort of dug into why 
I've got a real aversion now towards games that have been ported over to virtual reality. In my perspective, and from my experience of playing them, there's a very simple reason why I don't like these games, and it's because they make me sick. They make me feel like I'm going to vomit after about 10 minutes of playing them, which is not great. I've been using VR on virtually a daily basis now for four years, so I don't get the nausea effect anymore from most things. But a lot of these in particular, which I've just been playing before going to Borderlands 2, and Borderlands 2 is one of my favourite video games. Uh, the Borderlands 2 VR game, I can't do for more than five minutes without feeling so nauseous that I have to stand outside. I live on the first floor parking, so standing outside is a real effort for me because if I go too far, then I'm going to die. So we got to this sort of idea here, and I'd already kind of touched upon it in the book I wrote last year, The Reemergence of Virtual Reality, that there's built for VR games which combine all the elements of VR in order to make a gaming experience. And now we've got ported VR games, which are actually very popular. And you can imagine why from a commercial perspective, these are games that people have already played, already familiar with, and are moved over into a VR environment and using the headset rather than using the traditional gaming interface that they've been built for. And there's something really, really problematic about but to go beyond just making me feel physically uncomfortable, we wanted to unpick, okay, is there any way we can theorize why there's this big difference between the two? What is the qualitative difference between playing these games, built for VR games and VR ports, where theoretically can we start to draw a line between these two things? So, using Midgard's knowledge rather than mine, there are videos here, but I'm gonna skip over them because time is limited. Ported video games, use the familiar geographical cues to build up a sense of place in the game. And there's a long history of literature about this in the video game canon, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much now. The wayfinding and navigation in these ported games is really traditionally how we do this in video games anyway. That, for me, is why I get the nausea factor. I'm being asked to navigate the space in a way that doesn't fit with the medium that I'm actually using at that point in time, which is the VR headset. I am not using my television screen as a navigational tool in the game space at this point. I'm actually within the game space in this limited sense of using the PSVR. Much more sense in like the Oculus Quest, which I brought along today, if anyone wants to try. So these ported VR games, they don't give any affordances for virtual reality. They are just a translation of the original game into, the, into virtual reality. There's no manipulation of the mechanics in order to make some affordances for this new medium. The built for VR games deal with embodiment in a very, very different way. So embodiment actually becomes the mechanism for the creation of a sense of space in a VR game in that sense. You move just beyond virtual representations and shift the relationality of the player. In 40 games, it's an embodiment relation. In built for VR games, what we say, there is a hermeneutic relation to the game. So we move, and this is where I'm following from Don Hyde here, the great post phenomenologist. And I wish he'd used a different term for this, because he talks about embodiment relations. And I'm talking about embodiment as a hermeneutic relation. So embodiment relation actually doesn't mean embodiment in this sense. It means a mediation of the embodied experience. So, Mikol got to thinking, which is great. Because finally I've got someone who will do the thinking for me. This is a perfect relationship to try and make this What is it about the ported games that is really problematic in terms of the embodiment relation that we have with the game? There's no body or embodiment considered in the, the design of those spaces. If you're playing a ported over game like here we've got uh, Doom VR, although it's a first person shooter, it is not an embodied experience when you're playing it on a console. You are remote from it, you are distanced from it, it is a mediated experience. You are not being asked to embody that. Now you may 
gain a feeling of embodiment, but it is always distant from. So priority in these kind of uh, experiences is given to the architecture of the game in terms of space, rather than the phenomenological experience of the game for the user. So it's Andrew Reinhardt talking specifically about Skyrim VR in this case, but ports open license for a number of different things. And this lack of embodiment, this non-consideration of embodiment as a core principle of the VR experience, according to Eric Champion, means that we get a lack of virtual place. So when I'm in, so doing VR, I'm doing VR is another sort of vomit comment of the game. Um, there is no consideration in the design of this towards creating a sense of virtual place in the user. It is a ported over version of the original Doom game. It's fun, except the controls don't work and you get killed really, really quickly. But another problematic aspect of these ported games is that they tend to break immersion very, very easily, very, very quickly. Because of the imperfect representations of places and objects within them, and this porting over means that the visual fidelity of these games is really, really poor. And that's something actually that comes out mostly in the VR community itself. Um, the, the idea that games that aim for high realism in particular um, are really, really problematic when we transport them over to virtual reality. We, we, we sort of descend into the uncanny valley at that point. Uh, and a lot of games at the moment that are being worked on ports over to VR do aim for high levels of realism, and that is not ideal. Uh, instead, we need to take the edge of the realism a little bit and put them into virtual reality. So there's another aspect here of why they, these don't work. Built for virtual reality games, we've got to think, okay, so we've identified some problems here with these type of games. Okay, what, what, what works? What is different with these? What we wanted to put forward that there's sort of unreal modes of movement that help with immersion. Instead of looking at what video games do, which is try and build a mechanism and an engine to move in a particular environment, and to explore that environment, and there are customs, and there's a whole discourse and a discourse of formation around how that's done in video games. The games that work in virtual reality, and I know there's an irony of using super hot as the picture because that actually wasn't a VR game. But um, looking to utilize how the body can be moved in VR in different ways, in more effective ways, in a built for virtual reality experience, leads to a qualitatively different experience of gaming in these things. And for example, I'm sure most, well, I don't know, have most people played Beat Saber? It seems to be yes. No? <laughs> Got it loaded on the Quest headset for you. Robo Recall is a great one about the teleporting system in Robo Recall. It's not realistic in terms of movement, but it actually helps with the immersion in the experience in Robo Recall. And Super Hot and this relation of space and time with movement in it makes movement a critically important part of the experience to the extent to which after five minutes of playing it, you stop realizing how you're moving. And it, the, the movement itself withdraws from the cerebral body. Once that withdraws from circumspection, you can fairly be sure that you're immersed in that experience. That way. So, as I said, we based a lot of this around Don I. And what we wanted to argue is that in these built for VR games, place is embodied in a multi stable manner. The experience of space is situated, embodied, specific, and fully signifying when these things work. And therefore, we've got a sense of embodiment in a particular experiential world. Now, what I should draw specific, real close attention to is the word specific. What that means, as far as I'm concerned with this, is that in order to achieve high levels of immersion or presence, the design of motion and therefore world in that experience will be individualized to the particular game to copy over game mechanics and endlessly reuse the same mechanics over and over again is going to be problematic unless you are reproducing the same thing over and over again, which is going to be problematic for you in a commercial sense rather than in an experiential sense. So, really, the situated body specific and fully signifying 
these are things which are not necessarily achieved by porting games over into VR. They are achieved from building VR from the ground, building, building VR games from the ground up for the specific headset, the technology being used, etc. And as I said, where do we where are we getting this from? And this is from a number of uh, readings of Don Knight's work. This really is about um, the ported VR games and what he says about the embodiment relation that we have. And when Don Knight is talking about relations, he's talking about how we see the world and how we experience the world through our use of technology, of specific technologies. So in terms of uh, VR here, if we're doing, if we're using ported over games, we get an embodiment relation. We see the world as it's presented to us through the technology itself, and the headset becomes the mediator for that. Embodiment, therefore, is limited by the scope of the program and the architecture that is being put into it. The mediation of the experience really just comes through the headset that we're being used. We are not part of the world. It is a mediated experience for us, and that's what I call an embodiment relation of technology. What we want to argue is when VR is done right, and it can be done wrong, of course, and frequently is done very, very poorly. But when it is done right, and my one of my favourites, so I, I, this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, I have issues with work, but I play job simulator <laughs> for fun. So there's something wrong going on there, right? So <laughs> a hermeneutic relation is an understanding of the experiential world that comes through an engagement with the technology. Not just being presented with the world through the technology, but engagement with in particular ways. So touch, sound, movement, vision, rather than the mediation of embodiment relations, a hermeneutic circle of experience is formed if these things are done correctly. All embodied relations become withdrawn as we experience things. They become part of the experience rather than considering what elements and what things go into that experience. And that's what, if that happens, that's when we know we're in a hermeneutic relationship with a particular form of technology, a particular medium. That's liberally borrowing from the literature. Okay, so, as I said, we've, we've kind of, at the beginning of something here, and we've just been kicking these ideas around, and I've got a couple of bits in to start exploring these ideas more. But, Really, our starting point here is, you know, embodiment and embodiment relation is limited by the scope and design of the experience. The hermit and hermeneutic relations of embodiment is part of a series of experiential relations. And these, at the moment, fit the two sort of different types of VR game experience that we see. Although, I will add that I think perhaps there's a third sort of hybrid form emerging between the two as well. But there's hardly anything that fits in at the moment, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, that's the work of the record for this. I'll pay for my brief. Any questions for you? Um, hi, uh, I'm Vicky. Uh, I'm a PhD student here. I'm actually in the Department of English Literature, but again, I float the interdisciplinary journals. Um, so, yeah, today uh, I'm sort of drawing stuff out of my own PhD research into geographies of feeling. Um, and today I'll be talking about challenging the discourses of embodiment space and, and experiential horizons and virtual reality. And by that I kind of mean the, the prolific representations of VR, the kind of uh, advertising material we get access to, uh, what kind of experiences these shape and, and the expectations they produce and how they might not necessarily be all too realistic. Um, so, as I said, I'm not a geographer, but I am interested in the intricacies of interacting with virtual environments, uh, the way it feels to be present or not quite present within a virtual simulation and the real world simultaneously, uh, and the ways embodiment plays into this as well. So, let's draw the interest of that thing. So, um, as, as, as well as being interested in the spatial representations of VR, I'm interested in the spatial experiencing of VR as well, and I'll also be drawing from phenomenology, which I know has been a up this morning, which is great. Um, so I want, to, I want to think about how virtual space is experienced phenomenologically uh, and how that might provide an alternative to these sort of more potent representations we're getting uh, that 
necessarily can't capture these sort of real-time experiences. Um, and in so doing, I want to sort of think about the question of absolute agency in VR that seems to be pushed at us um, and sort of challenge that sort of absolute sense of agency. Um, and I think that geography is a feeling can capture some of that. Um, so, yeah, I'll be thinking about agency and access um, and sort of the ways VR feels and how this might be useful. Cool, so um, I want to suggest that current depictions of VR uh, currently stand at the intersection of these three geographies, uh, the first being natural geographies. Um, so by that, I mean that representations of immersion in popular advertising tend to valorise the spatial geography and, as, uh, and in doing so, they evade the reference to the hardware. Um, I will come on to some uh, more explicit uh, examples. Um, so you just get a depiction of a natural environment as opposed to paintings of a headset. Um, the next one I want to suggest is the importance of the domestic geographies uh, in advertising. Uh, and this, I want to argue, as opposed to an invasion of the headset, marks an invasion of the domestic space by the virtual environment. Uh, we kind of see spaces of uh, domestic walls kind of opening up onto virtual spaces. Um, and finally, uh, bodily geographies. Uh, that's where I want to land it. I'm going into that at the end. Um, but this is what I have a problem with in terms of bodily geographies, uh, the kind of valorisation of the user uh, and the body of the user in contemporary advertising to depict sort of very overt emotional and physical responses to the technology in order to kind of sell it. Uh, and this creates sort of weird uh, sort of expressions of, of how it actually feels. Um, so I put these arrows in to make it all look like a neat narrative, um, but I think in reality it kind of looks more like that. <laughs> um, so I'm not trying to suggest that all of these geographies are encompassing uh, or that they're all oppositional to one another. Um, rather, I want to think about how they all come into contact for our real-time lived experiences of doing VR. Uh, phenomenology allows for us to break through the popular framings of VR to consider its intimate geographies of feeling. So my work kind of goes between the framings of VR and how it's depicted as frameless and sort of lands somewhere in the middle when thinking about all these uh, different approaches. Um, so I'm going to turn to affect theory, uh, particularly in relation to digital technology, and I want to argue here the representations of certain geographies in VR advertising do away with some of the more intimate and embodied relationships um, so I want to sort of retain the importance of subjective experience uh, and the kind of complex interconnections of embodiment and feeling. Uh, and I want to say that the lines between the exterior body and the interior simulation are not neatly contained. Cool, so natural geographies. Uh, this is taken from the HTC Vive uh, advertisement from 2017. Um, so it, it sells it as a, a whole new reality kind of looks like a reality, I know, um, but <laughs> it's sort of this framing of a place where anyone has a chance to make their mark, um, little if any focus is given to the hardware itself, rather attention is paid to the potential VR users who seek to experience the supposed new reality this technology makes possible. Such a new reality, it is suggested, removes the individual from the constraints of any given social political reality so that anyone is able to make their mark. Uh, again, there's no reference to the headset. Um, and so this is sort of promoting access as a mode of making the headset disappear. This is saying it's that accessible that you technically feel like you're in the real world. Um, from my experience, that's not always the case. Um, domestic dog please. Um, so again, these are taken from HTC Vive advertisements, PSVR advertisements, and the Oculus Rift. Um, the HTC, uh, which we can see on a couple of these, but yeah, uh, the bottom one, um, uses room scale tracking, uh, cameras set up in four corners of the room. So this really plays on the sort of spatial experience in your VR. Um, and one of the ways they, they mark this sort of merging of the real and the, and the virtual is by sort of opening this space, which is typically a westernized domestic space, uh, very cushy and, and snazzy as well, which, which is, seems to be a thing. Um, and it's completely sort of opened up like a portal um, and 
and, and sort of that domestic space it sort of marks an invasion um, an invasion by the by the virtual um, so yeah we see a group of people sat on the sofa seemingly under the, under the scene um, so this this kind of again marks a different kind of access uh, which I think raises important questions about not only the access we have to the virtual environment but actually the access we give to this technology into the domestic space and I, and I know there's sort of a lot of considerations particularly um, with Oculus about the kinds of data that they're using and collecting um, particularly when the headsets have the capacity to sort of get data about your, your domestic space so there's a kind of reverse multi-directional access at play here um, that I think this can sort of benefit from. Uh, finally, bodily geographies. Um, so this kind of, again, evades any sense of materiality. We, we see in the PSVR advertisement that the headset kind of floats away into pixelated bits. Um, and again, VR's immersive potential is defined through its complete effacement uh, of the material hardware. Um, and again, as people probably know, uh, Bolton and Bruce have discussed this in remediation as the kind of logic of transparency, whereby the perfect interface enables the sensation of having fallen through the hardware interface into the world of computer graphics. Um, but in this instance, uh, the body becomes central. Uh, and I think that this does have some effective charge in that it uh, suggests that the user can feel as though they would feel in the real, real world around them. Um, but I think that to imply that VR equates to the everyday experiences of the world is, is limiting in, in some respects. Um, and I think that from my own experience and from talking about it with others, VR doesn't always work seamlessly with everyone. Um, in a lot of ways it presumes able-bodiedness, um, there are studies that suggest that the headsets are uh, fit to, uh, for male heads and not necessarily um, cater for, for, other, for females, for smaller heads um, of different types of hair. Um, th this sort of material factor is really important and I think that these kind of representations do away with some of that. Um, and I think that immersion can sometimes mask these affective intricacies um, in, a, uh, in, thinking about, in thinking about a phenomenology of affect it might allow for the interrogation of the processes and movements between one space and another. Um, so I kind of want to go into that now. Um, I have problems with this, as I've said, because I think it uses the user as a spectacle, um, and rather than the game or uh, application being the spectacle, the, the user's body and, and sort of response to the, to the environment uh, take forward. So, um, so I want to quickly run through some ideas um, that I've been thinking about in terms of trying to map a geography of feeling or sort of linking, thinking about how we might approach, uh, again, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, VR from, from the realm of affect theory. Um, so I want to think about three different points. And the first sector or, or sort of idea that I'm thinking about is ecologies of affect. Um, so I've cited Davidson as um, so ecologies of effect might be to do with the way the, subjects come, the subject comes into contact with the place she is in through a set of virtual affects, um, which form part of the production of that space. So again, I think that's a really important part of, of the virtual reality experience, is this sense that the body is in some way also contributing to the creation of that space. Um, so Davidson et al's work uh, thinks about uh, desire, nostalgia and memory in a, particular, uh, in a particular place and how sort of affect and embodiment factor into those feelings, their tones, their moods uh, and I think again we can really benefit from thinking about those things when we're interacting with VR, what are the kinds of moods and feelings and desires, what, what are these sort of very effective um, parts of, of being in VR. Um, bodily horizons, um, um, I, I'm taking in my body horizons because I think as opposed to the advertising which is very much centred on this limitless potential that everyone has, I like this mode of thought in that it says hey like limitations are a useful part of experience, let's think about limitations uh, and, what, and what they can tell us about 
about our experiences. Um, so, yes, Sarah Ahmed's work on queer phenomenology, which is what I cited here, uh, places issues of access at its core. So Ahmed, Ahmed takes the idea of giveness, the idea that the world reaches out to us and receives from us through, through our interactions with it, uh, thinks about the ways orientation affects access to the world. So aligning phenomenology in queer studies, Ahmed considers the ways phenomenology is always inherently entangled in social, political and cultural contexts to the degree that access to certain things is dictated by lived experience. Uh, Ahmed refers to heteronormativity as a straight way of seeing, an orientation towards the world which enables the most access. It's the path most trodden. And spaces that enact certain privilege, uh, where orientation differs to the sketch horizons of heteronormativity, Ahmed says, uh, when this when this kind of comes into contact, this, that action is blocked. Um, so she talks about uh, queer moments um, as that sort of lack of uh, extension into phenomenal space. Um, and she talked about bodily horizons. So the bodily horizon shows the line that bodies can reach toward what is reachable by also marking what they cannot reach. The horizon marks the edge of what can be reached by the body. The body becomes present as a body with surfaces and boundaries in the showing of the limits of what it can do. Uh, so a horizon marks a space in which bodies can access things. Uh, when reaching the limits of interaction within a space, our methods, the body's embodiedness and embeddedness becomes more present. Uh, its contours are brought to the service. And I think in terms of immersion, this could be a really useful way of thinking about it. Uh, in, again, in assuming this absolute access. Uh, and immersion has become this kind of prolific expectation of VR. Um, and as a consequence, there is a failure to collect to a collective failure to unpick the intricacies of what immersion means and how viewers, users inevitably, inevitably play a part in it. To acknowledge how VR feels is to challenge the idea <coughs> that immersion is inherently good or ethically devoid. It enables awareness that proximity and movement are felt uh, and that sometimes these factors can implicate compromised senses of agency, which developers and audiences alike need to be more aware of. Um, so let's think more about access, uh, where it falters and who. Uh, and finally, um, I've been taken in by Susan Hazel's work, which is fantastic for anyone interested in VR. She's produced some really great work recently about um, affect and VR. Um, so for Kozel, a phenomenology of affect is conceptualised uh, through sort of somatic embodiment uh, or somatism, uh, and she uses this as a mode of accessing the body as a synergy of processes. Uh, so she thinks about uh, the body's interaction with non-human and objects uh, others as well. Um, so Kozel actually uses this mode of access uh, to think about the feelings VR produces, uh, claiming that VR is able to produce what she calls a shimmer, um, a mixture of strangeness and delight where expectations do not, do not map directly onto perceptual flow and create a small rupture. So again, there's this idea that feelings can actually go against the expectations that these very specific framings of VR produce. And there's good use of that, because I think you, when you try VR, it's different to how you can ever expect. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that. Just to conclude, um, I want to sum up my ideas at the moment. Um, so I want to suggest that current advertisements and discourses uh, around VR fail to capture the intimacies and intricacies of access and agency that are implicated in the experiences of VR technology. So that is to say that the sort of embodied and effective dimensions of our VR experiences are as important as the kind of uh, predominant discourses that we get and the, and the representations of those experiences. Let's think about our lived experiences on this. Um, Phenomenology might allow for the consideration of geographies of feeling in order to uh, critically interpret and evaluate experiences. So again, again, I think that the kind of effective dimensions of VR can open up this kind of critical interpretation of VR that we can't necessarily access otherwise. Um, stepping into a technology is different for everyone. Um, I'm taking that from the Oculus advertisements which use step into Rift. Um, from experience of using with VR with students, uh, some of them don't want to enter VR in a public group. It's not something that they want to do, they don't like the idea that they're in a room full of people watching them and they can't see them. Uh, there's all these sort of different 
things that arise when you're using VR in the real time that you don't expect otherwise. Um, and I think, again, I think developers and users and practices of VR uh, need to be more aware of, of this and sort of think about these ethical questions. Uh, and finally, um, challenging absolute access is a mode of everything you can imagine. Um, so I want to think about all the ways VR might not be accessible and how those are also important, um, not necessarily to do away with immersion, but just to think about it, break it down a little bit, because it tends to be this sort of big word that has lots of different dimensions to it. Let's break it down and bring it back. Um, that's me. Thank you. Um, just some plugging of open access stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. raised and has 
being raised over and over again um, through questions of feminist techno science and the future of women. Um, so this kind of question of, of reimagining who did we start in politics. And this question of vernacular cartography. And so Gaston, so Teresa Gaston, um, writes, Afrofuturists visualize a social imaginary reading of vernacular cartography, the study effects of making maps to combine techno vernacular creativity and aesthetics to build on a premise that cultural systems and data can more communicate spatial information in many ways. So basically, this kind of thinking has always been emerging. Uh, it has been emerging for quite a long time. If we think about the cartographic and the cartographic case in the book. Four, um, thinking about cartography. So I'm a cartographer by training. I did a meeting for and I went into geography and I couldn't cartography. And this question of we and you has actually been already unpacked at length by critical cartography over the past 30 years. It's been this ongoing um, question that <coughs> not that cartography has a universal ambition. It wants to try and describe all places under singular systems. If we think about the Cartesian coordinates, the coordinate system, or if we think about uh, mind.
perspective or way. Um, and so you can bring this kind of object pretty easily into this plane. There is a sense of universality, this continuity of, of humanity. I'll get to feminism in a few minutes. Um, what becomes important is when, so I think that's good. And you can even choose the sun. Um, I think some of the kind of pre enlightenment geographers would be really overjoyed to see that humanity does indeed control the sun, um, and the sun can be put wherever you want it to be put. Um, so you kind of get these different choices about how you do it and where you put it. And similarly, this is kind of how it appears in the community. Um, I put the sun inside the building because there's no reason why I could. Thank you. 
are a queen of these unsaved entities, then why is Stacy not also these these bodies? Why is Stacy, you know, she she's constructed, but in her constructedness, she's also unfinished. She's, you know, she is this kind of modest witness that stares back at the technology. And we can actually use that to try and make some critical points about the way in which these technologies are constructed. So you would Realities, etc. 
rather than understanding that this desire for absolute access, then why do we not understand it as always situated, always contingent, always partial? Rather than giving in to these universal ambitions, rather than giving in to these overarching capitalist discourses, this hype that the digital can conquer the world, why do we not take up the early work around xenofeminism, Afrofuturism, um, and, and cyberfeminism that emerged in the United States? Well, actually, digital technologies are partial, and we need to embrace that. We need to actually take that on board and use those partialities, those incompletenesses, as Corinne says, those gaps, as um, Sadie Plant says, to find an anti-capitalist, a queering, a radical feminist, a decolonizing way of understanding these systems of knowledge. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so uh, thank you for coming. So I'm Sally, that's James over there. Um, and we're sort of co-creators of um, LitCraft. Um, I guess the main thing to say is it's an educational resource. So I'm going to talk today is not really a high-level research paper. It is sort of explaining the nature of the educational resource. And our targets and aims are linked to that. So it's basically um, a resource that is essentially literary, but also very spatial, uh, and kind of about the place and space of literature. It's actually the it's like a spin-off really from a from a major project, um, HRC funded funded project, which is called Chronicles of Cartographies, which is about mapping uh, literary place and space in new ways uh, through digital technology. Uh, not VR at the moment, but two D and three D. Um, Watch this space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is like the the impact element. Um, so yeah, very simply, um, it, it's an impact project. It's it's based with schools and libraries and also museums. It's about re-engaging children with literary classics um, using the Minecraft environment, um, and it's linked to educational resources. So um, the very simple structure at the heart of it, which is um, which has been, I think, part of what makes it successful. <clears throat> is it's kind of linked resource. So it starts out in the world, um, in the text, it starts with the text, it, it moves into the immersive environment and it comes out and goes back to the text. And this kind of uh, virtuous circle has actually, which we sort of stumbled across by chance really, um, has made it very successful. So the world, the build in Minecraft is an accurate scale model of the map at the front of the text which means you can use that map to negotiate the Indian world, um, and the resources are directly linked to what is happening in the text. And so what we were trying to do <coughs> was to create a, a, a model that, in which you know, reading and gaming are not played off against each other, but actually they're working together to reinforce meaning, and that, it has done that very successfully. So the way it works, um, this is the Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson, this is like the contents of Treasure Island and the highlighted sections are um, where we have a task linked to uh, what's happening in the text. Ideally, we designed it initially for school use, although it has now been used by, by libraries. So the idea originally was you'd be reading the whole book and then at certain key points you'd use the resource linked to it. Um, but we also now have like a minimum read uh, as well. So when libraries started using it, they're often not reading the whole book, so we kind of redesigned it so you have like, you must always have some text, we always want some reading experience, thinking about the text before you go into it, with like a minimum and a maximum. Um, so to, to give that sense of how they reinforce each other, the first um, task, in-game challenge if you like, is centered on my shore adventure. So in the book, um, the boy Jim Hawkins, who's the narrator, runs ashore, he, he sneaks onto a boat, he gets onto the island, he's not really meant to be there, he runs around and sees various things, various things happen to him. Um, so, you know, if you're teaching it, you'd read hopefully that whole chapter, at least the minimum read, and you kind of think about Jim's character, why did he do that, was that okay, um, have a look at the map, think about the island, um, and then you go into the in-game task, um, and actually that's a different in-game task, but it, in get, the first task is a scavenger hunt. Uh, you read in the book and it will tell you what, what to do. So you open the chest, um, read the book and it will, it will tell you what to do. So in fact the first task of Treasure Island is, is running around the island, finding lots of things. This is actually a, the third task, search, search for treasure. 
Um, and um, so the child is reenacting essentially what happens in the book. The first person um, narrative perspective of Jim as narrator is then sort of reinforced, if you like, by the first person within the world. Um, and then if I were teaching it, I'd come out and get to write up a piece about how did it feel to explore an unknown world or how do you think Jim felt. Um, and so this is, this is kind of the structure, basically. Um, when we first did Treasure Island, we found that a lot of teachers and librarians immediately said to us, it's, it looks really good, but I, I, it would work best with reluctant readers. So we haven't really thought about that. So this concept of children who are struggling with reading in different, for different reasons. Um, and so we started to think about that. This is a standard model used to teach children to read in primary schools in the UK. And basically what it shows you is there's an axis where you, kept, you could be good at everything, you could be bad at everything, but actually a lot of people are in this axis where you might have good comprehension but poor decoding, or good, uh, uh, good decoding and poor comprehension. And so we started to think, actually, actually, Linkcraft meets the needs of all these different readers. So, and there are different kinds of reluctant reader when you start to think about it. So you can have a very good reader who, who doesn't read, because they play games all the time. <laughs> um, and so ironically, it's actually using that, he's using the gaming environment to return them to reading. Um, and you can have a very poor reader. It will definitely help them, because it will give them context, it will increase their understanding. But we then redesigned it a bit to put more, more tasks in, sort of simple comprehension tasks, simple decoding tasks, in the next build. So the next build was for Kintsuki's Kingdom, which is a really great book by Michael Morpurgo. We start with the idea of an island narrative, which is our kind of theme for various reasons, mainly because it's a very self-contained world, they can't wander off, um, but also it works really well to have kind of linked uh, island theme. Um, and Kensuke's Kingdom, much simpler text, much shorter text, still very powerful, um, and so we had more tasks um, linked to it in game. Um, and as I say, it's like kind of slightly simpler tasks. So for example, um, yeah, the first task called finding, so it's another locational task, and you, you have to move around the island, find four beacons that are located at these different spots, um, and when you get, when you find a beacon, so for example, uh, Kinsey's uh, boat, um, there's, a, there's a very short passage uh, from the book put on there, so Kinsey, I can see my island, he brought his hand down sharply like a chopper. And the question in the book for the kids is, what is Kensuke trying to try and say? How is this handbook job? So they can write a little answer and then they can say some very short, simple tasks. Um, we also have kind of creative tasks. I always have a creative task at least. So again, in the text, Kensuke, the Japanese guy who's there's a, there's a Japanese guy who's abandoned on the island from the war, and then Michael, the English boy who's who's abandoned there. It's about the relationship. And so at the beginning, he kind of makes a model of the island and draws this line and says, you're on this side, I'm on this side. Um, and this is just showing you. So in the game, you can see this, this line in the sand is like marked on the cross line as well. Um, and so we have a kind of link task at that point in the book where they, the children go to a kind of flat piece of sand off the, off the coast and they can build and model either the island themselves in colour or in sand, or they can do something that represents the island, so sometimes they can do a turtle, something for, for them that signifies it. And then you can take a screenshot from above and you can get those images out, out of the game as well. It's also very useful if you have reluctant writers. So reluctant readers are often also reluctant writers. Um, and so you can get kids writing in game, and you can then take a photo of that and get it out of game, and say, actually, you know, you don't think you can write, but actually you've written quite a lot. So I think it has quite a lot of potential. You know, it works great with mainstream kids, but I think it does have a lot of potential with low ability kids or poor uh, autistic kids as well, and various kinds of uh, challenges to reading. Now, right at the end of the book, the, the, he finds his parents come back to find him. So the last task, you go off into the deep ocean and you find them. Um, so yeah, just a couple of bits of feedback from, from that. Um, yeah, we've got great feedback from the school trials and the library trials. Um, one concern I had was, you know, will they just kind of read, zip through the book because they want to get onto the game? That's what if I've had to predict it. They just said they're not really going to care about the book. They just want to get on the game. That, that did not happen counterintuitively, and the libraries also said this. They were surprised um, that that did not happen. So they actually re worked really well to reinforce each other. So comments like this from the kids. Maybe wonder what's happening next. Being in the world made you think about what's going to happen actually in the 
book. Um, and again, the last comment, let's carry on playing, I need to treat the next part, each help the other. So it actually worked to kind of re-hook them, hook them back into reading. Um, you know, more, better than I thought it would. You know, so I was pleased with that. And the other key point, you know, um, people dissing empathy, but I actually think empathy is great um, for fiction. Fiction is the place where you should be developing your empathetic skills as a kid anyway. Um, and one thing that came through very strongly for us is uh, it massively enhanced empathetic engagement with the characters. So that was the strongest thing that came through. And we got this a lot. When I played the game, I understood more of the book, how hard it was for him to be a little bit family. So empathy is very difficult to teach, actually, in schools. If you're a secondary school teacher, it's a difficult thing to teach. So it very that's very useful, I think, to teachers and interesting. So that's just to give you a kind of taste of the kind of main resource. And I'm just going to talk briefly about kind of adaptation of that. Um, since this is a geographic conference, I thought we'd kind of think a bit more about um, place and space uh, out of the world as well. So we have a couple of museum builds that we're just doing now, about to do, uh, over the summer. And so one of these is a partnership with the Wordsworth Trust. We're from Lancaster University. This is very close to the Lake District, and I'm an expert in romantic literature, so that makes sense to me. So Wordsworth um, lives in the Lake District, and he has this uh, concept, very interesting concept, called the spots of time. Essentially, um, well, I'll read it out, and then I'll it. So he says, there are in our existence spots of time which with distinct preeminence retain a fructifying virtue. Whence, depressed by trivial occupations and the round of ordinary intercourse, our minds, especially the imaginative power, are nourished and visibly repaired. Such moments chiefly seem to have their date in our first childhood. So Wordsworth, um, way ahead of Freud, um, basically says, those, your very earliest memories, before you have a continuous memory, continuous memory are these like pockets kind of like bubbles of time that, that are held within you and these are you know deeply essential to who you are and to your identity and he's making the point for himself you know these spots of time determine who I become without these kind of core elements very very early experiences and memories of them um, I wouldn't have become a poet and so in the prelude his autobiographic epic he then describes these various first two books are sort of about his childhood and he describes these childhood experiences in the late. Um, and so what we're doing is creating a resource um, linked to this. So we have a Minecraft map of the Lake District um, to quite a large scale, which is what we need. Um, and um, again, I'm just going to talk to you through one example. So there's different examples like steals birds, eggs. he's quite a naughty boy actually, William Wordsworth. He steals, steals eggs, he steals a boat and rows out on the lake and he goes skating as well. And these are, these are kind of very famous passages uh, in the poem. So I'm just gonna read this as well, a bit of poetry, won't hurt anybody. Um, and in the frosty season when the sun was set and visible for many a mile, the cottage windows through the twilight blaze, I heeded not their summons. Happy time it was indeed for all of us. To me it was a time of rapture. Clear and loud the village clock told six. I wheeled about, proud and exulting like an untired horse that cares not for his home. All shod with steel, we hissed along the polished ice and games, confederate, imitative of the chase, and woodland pleasures, a resounding horn, the pack loud chiming and hunted hair. So through the darkness and the cold we flew. So this is uh, one of the very sensory, very um, evocative um, spots of time for words with me remembering these early experiences. This is a nice little image of people skating off uh, the lakes when they used to freeze over, which they don't anymore. Um, so what we'll do, what we're going to do is build a kind of frozen version of Windermere using those maps and then we'll have a, like a little uh, reading of the passage outside the game, read the passage, same thing, same model, comprehension and then go in and kind of reenact um, this experience and kind of uh, you know, respond to the poetic text. Um, and then this is going to be located within the museum space. Um, so the Words of Trust has got a massive a uh, rebuild of the museum for next year. Next year is the 250th anniversary of Wordsworth's birth. And so for Wordsworth 2020, they're going to relaunch the space and we're going to be, this resource is going to be a corridor in the middle of the museum. Um, so what we're also going to do is then link it to objects in the museum. So you do your ice skating and then you go out and you have to go around the museum and find both the passage, you get the manuscript that has that in and one of Wordsworth's skates, which is in the museum. 
And so it's kind of, again, linking them, linking the out, outer world to the inner world, I think. Um, and finally, four minutes ago, uh, second museum project. So that's kind of rural um, landscape project. And um, we also have an urban one with seven stories Newcastle. Uh, which is the National Children's Literature Archive. And we're going to build this like tower, a map of, of, of uh, an area in Newcastle with tower blocks and a kind of disproportionate tower block with various uh, creative uh, literary activities inside it. Okay, so if you're interested, come to the workshop this afternoon. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, partly through James. So James and I had a pilot project which was called Latecraft, mm. and the words one is kind of returning to that a bit. So we did um, we got some HRC money, knowledge exchange money, and we did like a pilot project using a lakes map and had sort of environmental. So it's derived from the corpus of Lake District writing, which is a which is a corpus of early travel writing about the area, mm -hmm. and um, I was trying I, I had the idea of trying to use Minecraft to engage, to adapt that material to a younger audience, to introduce it, um, to introduce corpse linguistics and yeah. corpse analysis to school-age audiences. And then um, part of that included a, um, a Swallows and, Ab uh, Swallows and Abbasons build, a very small part of it, but that took off really well and that sort of yeah. indirectly led yeah. to. So, so, we came, so that was one major thing. So and, all, and, all, and also you had a seven-year-old son at the time yes. as well. <laughs> that was also another significant factor. So my name is Gareth Young, um, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher on the Building City Dashboards project at Maynooth University in Ireland. Um, my colleague here is Oliver Dawkins. Um, he is our uh, 3D data and immersive technologies expert, as well as uh, our data and training coordinator. Um, so we're going to talk today uh, about a piece of work that we're doing on immersive geographies. Um, and this is, this is a smaller part of a, of, of a larger project that, that is uh, intended to focus on the uh, application of mixed reality technologies for uh, urban data visualizations and um, just basically ex exploring and extending the modality of city dashboards as, as they are presented uh, traditionally. So what is a city dashboard? Well, city dashboards are data portals and as many of them exist today, they are used to present a curated list of data sets. And these are uh, representative of the respective cities. So Dublin has one, um, New York, London. There are lots of city dashboards around the world. And these data uh, are collected together by um, a diverse number of, of organizations. And each of these uh, institutions have their own agendas to fulfill. Um, and the data then are also used by uh, secondary stakeholders to, to make more informed decisions about their daily lives, um, such as, is it raining? Should I take a bike from the bike hire station or should I just take the bus? You know, these are, these are the type of things that we're looking at. Um, so the, the data that's generated in smart cities like this are also being used to um, contribute to discourse around how cities are quantified and uh, how data can be accessed, collated together, and then compared to other cities around the world. So the immersive geographies uh, side of, of what we do. Um, well, we, we're exploring how emergent mixed reality technologies can be used with the city data in uh, a number of different ways. So for example, to bring the world around us into the virtual, or to intermix our everyday lives with um, digital objects and, and information. Um, so on top of this as well, uh, we're also interested in how mixed realities um, can also be used for presenting and uh, communicating data via multimodal interactions, where the um, urban data themselves can lend themselves to new approaches in experimental natural user interfaces, um, and, and other communication techniques um, that can potentially afford our users a uh, deeper understanding. Um, and and this, this is across the range, you know, not just not just suits and academics, but people in the, on the street as well and in the communities. So 
existing mixed reality technology uh, can take lots of different forms. And I'm not sure about the room, so I'm going to go a little bit into that uh, just to explain um, and talk about something called Milgram's reality virtuality continuum, basically real and, and, and virtual on, on either end of that. Um, but on this um, continuum, the technologies that we re readily recognize as such as augmented reality, virtual reality can be uh, put. And this also um, includes things called augmented virtualities as well. Um, so simply put, this continuum is used to describe uh, the, the degrees to which the, the physical and digital content that we have are, are used in a digitally mediated experience. Um, and this enables us then to create composites or entirely new environments and experiences where physical and digital entities can coexist together in varying degrees um, and can be interacted with in real time. So from exploring new mixed reality data visualizations uh, it, from contemporary research practice, um, we can already see a shift towards how different multimodal displays the, the techniques can be explored, basically, and uh, where these multimodal displays can uh, greatly benefit both the creators of, of, of data and the users by providing them with uh, no novel and quite qualitatively different experiences. Um, uh, yeah, and, and they, they can also then communicate this, um, this data across multiple media and in multiple sensory, sensory registers as well on top. Um, and this potentially means that we can um, lower the, the cognitive load that is placed on our users by, uh, um, by engaging with the, the, this multimodal communication. And it means that we're able to um, also bring in um, these things, the, the, the urban mapping applications that we're looking at, and, and create them and program them as a uh, full-bodied experience something that, as evidence has suggested, um, enhances the perception of usability and the overall user experience of these technologies. Um, so urban data on our dashboards, they, 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 they represent a phenomenon that occurs within a geographic space. And these data can be explored in multiple ways. And they're used to help us to understand what gives these places their specific characters and their meaning. And at the same time, what the data uh, tells us and the perceptions of the individuals that are on the ground there can, can greatly differ. Um, and this sort of the, the city and the data relating to it uh, and its interpretation um, depends upon many different factors, such as the, uh, the physical aspects, uh, uh, sorry, the scale, the, the perspective, and the intention of the user. Um, so, from a material material perspective, we can uh, we can focus on the physical attributes of the city, uh, such as its infrastructure, the, the buildings there, and the environmental conditions. And from a social perspective, we could also focus on, say, the, uh, the thoughts, feelings, and intentions of the people that live in these environments. So the spaces and events represented in data visualization often fail to resonate with people's experiences of sense of place. And this is a limitation, this, this is a limitation of the kind of representations of place we, uh, we find on GIS maps in uh, and on city dashboards that, that we make. Um, so we're, we're reflecting upon that to, to, uh, to try to improve upon it. And it's something that we feel could be potentially addressed through the use of mixed reality technologies. So bringing together real-time city data, um, 3D modeling, and the citizens, uh, we can potentially then contribute to the creation of a replica uh, of the urban landscape. And by doing so, we can establish uh, a bridge between the physical world and uh, the, the, the virtual worlds that, that we've been talking about today. And at the same time, there is a, a growing interest uh, among urban municipalities in the creation of these real-time digital twins. Um, and these are digital representations of a, a system of interest 
that are uh, coupled with their physical counterpart. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, <laughs> they're coupled with their physical counterpart in such a way that uh, the, the, the relevant changes in, in the latter are tracked and updated in the digital version in, the, in, in real time. Excuse me, in real time. So, that's it too. So this, uh, this type of, thank you. So this, uh, this, this, this digital twin, thank you very much, uh, is being enabled through the use of multiple sensors and, and, and communication and sharing uh, through this, this thing that you might have heard a lot of recently, the IoT, the Internet of Things. So in a virtual environment, we can enable real-time experiences of data-driven experiences, data-driven data environments. But uh, at the same time, we also want to include the more qualitative experiences of place um, that are perhaps much harder to capture than the numerical output of a sensor network. And what, um, what we aspire towards in our current explorations of multimodal interaction is uh, a means of engaging both uh, both together uh, both the quantitative and the qualitative aspects of urban data and phenomena and the phenomena it represents um, and this includes real-time data visualizations for for higher bikes so you can see here a, a visualization that includes a higher bike um, data feed um, and this uh, also expands into the, again, the more imaginative representations of areas of the city. Rather than just a literal model that you often see with the data, with the data just overlaid on top of it. Um, so while these new computational techniques can allow us an overview of the city in real time, um, mixed reality can provide us with a much, uh, much wider opportunities for the, uh, the visceral or multi-sensory encounters that we, uh, we can uh, engage data with. And these are ones that could potentially provide new avenues for citizen engagement as well. So we plan on implementing this by making urban data more immediate and meaningful by placing it in a context uh, in such a way as to better inform some of the policies that uh, directly affect the places that people live and work in. Um, and by enriching urban data visualizations in this way, we can then potentially provide a deeper, deeper qualitative uh, meaning to the to data, um, relating it to events that perhaps fall outside of the citizens' immediate spheres of, of experience. So we've explored this uh, in, in our first workshop, um, so the, 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 the concept has, has been uh, gone through the cycle once here, where we, we, um, we held a workshop at the Science Gallery in Dublin on the 1st of June this year. And in the session, um, Oliver and the, the rest of the BCD research team demonstrated a, a virtual reality application, um, showing the different ways in which um, different media could be used to enhance a 3D model of the Dublin's, Dublin's uh, Dockland area. Um, and this is a, a, a 3D model that was commissioned by Dublin City Council and made openly available for anyone to use. So there's a large chunk of Dublin in 3D that you can access for free and the County Council went out and procured that from a surveying company. So there's a very, uh, very interesting free resource for you there. Um, so the, the team then took, uh, took the, the, the people from the workshop, from the classroom, from the, the meeting room, on an expedition on foot into the Docklands area. Um, and the workshop visitors were then, um, they, they then captured sounds, they, they captured still images and 360 videos, and were shown how to use their mobile phones to capture uh, and create their own 3D photogrammetry um, objects for inclusion within this model. And you can see one kind of there represented behind the title. Um, and so the, the group basically learned how to generate their own content that could be included in an enhanced, co-created 3D model of, of this area. And this form of public engagement 
can potentially be more inclusive of the, the greater citizen populations that occupy these spaces and help them to create their own representations of digital space, um, digital place rather, <laughs> um, where uh, members of the public can be more directly involved in the capture of 3D city data and can contribute to the production of a 3D model of a city through the use of open source software and open data such as and, uh, 3D editing packages, programmetry and, and training and outreach uh, processes like, like we went through. And the sort of wider implications of this research could potentially be seen in future outreach programs like this, um, where the same learning process can be, be integrated into civic engagement projects. Um, and where citizens can learn how to capture, process, and uh, present multimedia content um, in their own 3D projects. And as a, a future technology for narrative and data dissemination, this can uh, potentially expand both citizen engagement with data and encourage them then to also contribute more of themselves to the creation of digital representations of place. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone's running on time. <laughs> um, so, does anyone have any questions for? Yeah. Uh, I work for the Environment Agency, and this is kind of I think we're pursuing a lot more. Um, when playing about with this kind of thing, one of the problems that always comes back to me is, I guess, the difference between operational data that we might produce, like a flood model, for example, a flood risk model output, um, overlaying that in a geo-reference geo reading space often serves more to highlight the imprecise nature of the flood models or the, the data that we're trying to display than um, do a good job of visualising. And it feels like to me there's almost an interpretation layer that's missing out. Have you experimented with that or is that something that you're, that you've considered or you're aware of? We, we did, um, we did uh, uh, go in and speak to the OTW, yeah, the, yes, the Office, Office of Public Works mm -hmm. in um, Ireland, and they were very interested in both the modelling but I think their plan was to use the virtual reality purely for a kind of, if we put a you know a, a bridge here or, or something yeah, like that, we want to see that. We've, <laughs> we've looked at, at the modelling and I think there is, uh, we, we use game engines because they give you a lot of versatility in the kind of data that you can integrate, but I think there is a difficulty if you want to show real-time visualizations as something as complex if you actually want to show the flows of the currents there's a certain amount of abstraction um, that needs to happen in order to do that um, I've been lucky in that I've been given a lot of opportunity with the project to try bad things and, and see if they actually work or not um, so for example I think a couple of slide backs there was a kind of heat map, um, like a 3D heat map. Now, in VR it more really creates an atmosphere rather than, you know, so pure virtual reality isn't always a good way to try and communicate these kind of messages. You can show sort of the rising of water very easily, but to give an overview of a, uh, you know, of a, of a complex kind of watershed model, which is probably not necessarily the best way to visualize that yeah. that kind of complex information and well, arguably seeing stuff on a, a, a 2D display for that, you know, because you don't need the immersion for a lot of these kind of visualizations. I think what they do give you is a sense of place that's always lacking from the kind of, definitely from the high level dashboard view and then also even from the kind of abstracted map level view. So there's always a balance about the message that we're trying to tell how we're going to tell it and what the what the user needs to see and I think it sounds like you want a moving dynamic GIS more more than a, a, a so you know there's a, there's a difference between a kind of a digitally mediated environment and a virtual reality experience and it's uh, you're you're looking for a real time digitally mediated environment if you like but with a high level overview perhaps. Yes, or, so or a hybrid, maybe you need that top scale and lower scale <laughs> view. Though. We've done a lot of research on people and how they can see data, I guess, members of the public, and 
that most people don't understand maps or diagrams or even graphs. So it's something that more contextualizes. So sorry, yeah. I won't have it's in the later about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sorry, Richard. Yeah. We're going a bit behind. The boss has just stuck his head in the future. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry for saying the last thing we've talked. All right. Okay. You, you may have seen over in the, the other room, um, there's a funny little object, and there were some projections in the back room. That, that's a piece of work which I'm going to talk about now. And um, I'm going to leave the background on there and just talk about how it relates to some of the interests of this group. It's, uh, it's part of a project that I was invited to take part in with two other um, participants. And it was part of a initiative called the Post Photography Prototyping Prize, which was organised by Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland and the Photographers Gallery in London. And they, they've been running this thing for a few years now. There's been various different uh, competition entries and winners through the years. Um, we were put forward as a potential competing team. And really, the idea is to sort of think about um, post photography as, as an emerging category. The, the idea of Photography after photography, or photography that's aware of photography. Um, part of what I've been aware of as I kind of see some of the, the other presentations is I think what a uh, critical photographic perspective can, can bring is an idea of, is, is to break apart this idea of the image as a kind of neutral object, which, which you know, is you know, subject to a viewer, and think more about how the object image has agency in the room. So we began with this, this point um, from Wilhelm Flusser. And we started thinking about, you know, what is what does a photographer do? What does a photographer perform? The producer of images um, is somebody who uh, is actively engaged in the set of behaviours rather than somebody who's just mutely evading the instructions of technology. A lot of this comes from my interest in Philip Foster, who's a theorist who really looks at technology as a conditioner of behaviour, but specifically photographic technology. Um, as game, which is the sense we're talking about today, uh, but also photographers well, as functionaries who play out the instructions that the equipment gives them. Um, here he talks about uh, photographers stalking uh, through the tundra, and it's become more relevant as you see the work uh, as it goes on. So, we we'll talk a bit about the background of it. Um, so, the, the prize, uh, we won the competition last year in, in May, the photographer's gallery. Uh, and we had 24 hours to make this prototype. And uh, we kind of cheated a bit because we had the conversations on Skype beforehand, so we definitely had a plan what we're going into. Um, I guess post photography, um, again, I'll kind of explain what it is, but Daniel Rubenstein uh, gives a really good definition of it. Um, it takes an, it's an idea of photography that takes into account all those things that are supposedly extraneous to the image, like labor relationships, means of production process um, uh, and behaviour. So it's, it's photography sitting within a much wider web of human activity. It's, be, it's even got coffee table books now. So it's become a thing. Um, and post-digitality as well. We talk a lot about the digital as if, as if we're still in this moment. Of, you know, the post-digital condition is a kind of state of ennui where it's become kind of normal now. You know, it's no longer <coughs> exciting. It's just the background noise of everyday life. And occasionally there are, there, there, there's some wow moments, but it's gradually setting into this thing where you know, the digital is, is almost like wallpaper. So where, where do we go now that we've already kind of immersed in this, um, this background? Um, this is the team who um, produced the project that you see next door. Cool. Myself, Adam Brown, today is Ailey, who's a games designer from uh, Switzerland, and Alan Warburton, who is a CGI artist, who's done tons and tons of amazing work. Fascinating work, critical work on CGI. Um, you know, he reproduced uh, BBC's old White City headquarters as a 3D model, navigated side. He works a lot with ideas on gender, um, the, the alienated worker, critics of capitalism, etc. Some of Tobias' work, she does socially engaged games. This is a piece called First Strike, which is a nuclear war simulation where you have to be, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this one, it's an indie game. Uh, where you, you gain uh, the apocalypse, basically. You have to decide to take the first strike. Uh, Cloud Chasers uh, follows the journey of a refugee family across a desert and a futuristic apocalyptic landscape. This is Alan's work. This is a piece called Spheral Harmonics, 
which is some kind of twisted, surreal version of real estate in, in CGI. So he, he takes this, he, he works quite a lot with, with uh, assets which is acquired uh, by purchasing them from asset, asset libraries, but then he puts them together into interior environments which are decorated and, and, and so that they reveal their own construction. So they're, they're kind of like, you know, digitally watched real estate environments, but as you walk through them, they morph, they blow apart. You know, it's really neat. And Homo Economicus is a piece he's recently made about uh, male uh, workers in the city of London and the way their bodies and their bodily behaviour um, is commodified by the system. So the, the, the way in which the male body is behaved and conditioned. This, this work feeds into where this project is going. And this is some of my work from the background. Um, well, like, um, as I said, we're going to and taking the cameras apart and put them back together again in order to subvert the system. This was a single pixel digital, digital camera built with Arduino, and I ran three or four workshops with these where I tried to get people to construct a camera from the basic electronics, um, all of which ended in colossal failure, but the process was very, very interesting because we were thinking about the modest technology, and with a bunch of guts all over the table, you're starting to, to work tap in a tactile and haptic way with the things that are otherwise a black box, which is not a term which Philip kind of Flossie uses. Um, um, I always have a side interest in um, digital architecture, uh, hence what comments to Vincent, um, where uh, I write a lot about uh, CGI architecture and real estate and economic, the economic impacts of CGI architecture. These are universities made from fragments of universities that don't exist yet with a generative system. This is the future campus developments that actually need to be built. You know, they just sell the idea of futurity to uh, an eager audience willing to shell out and, and get costly in debt for the hope of uh, possible future prosperity. But that's us. We divided into a team. Alan, we gave, he, he occupied the light space part of the triangle. So they are game, narrative, and story, and myself. Later. Some of our inspirations, Gareth Damien Martin, uh, this was a self-published book actually last year, and it's a project called Continuous City, and he goes around, uh, he's a, a gamer, but he, he loads up film into an analog camera, and then photographs the streets of GTA, and then produces them in the dark. So it's, it's street photography, okay, it's where I cut my teeth, you know, go around, you know, 35 mil camera shooting black and white film in the 80s. Um, here he is going around the, the streets of uh, digital landscapes as if he is, you know, Robert Frank. Uh, uh, I love that project. Um, Alan was quite interested in the way um, the process, the process, and how things break down. So I mean, this, this idea of being generative, we talked about the generative. Generative photography is photography where you're, you're photographing things that you've set up to happen. You put a mechanism in the process, the mechanism produces stuff, and then you capture it in some form. So you might you know, produce an algorithm in processing, or some other coding language in Python, it generates visuals, and then you as the photographer or the image maker, you sit back and you capture chunks of that process that you, I guess you select either on a semi-optic or an effective or aesthetic basis. As your hands in white, it falls into that kind of category. Um, some really interesting things. But, you know, the light is really, really important to the project. If you have a look at the landscape we built next door, uh, the way in which light and time uh, produce themselves, it's made in unity, a lot of models <coughs> are done in Maya. Uh, there's a lot to get in here, so excuse me if <laughs> you can ask me all about this afterwards. Uh, so generative photography, okay, produced by process. But effectively, with generative processes, you're, you're setting something in motion, um, in order to produce a determinate results that could potentially carry on in infinite in, in temporality. For example, Jeb Finer with a musical piece called Long Player, which is a, an algorithm written for uh, a Mac, which plays to better than scene bowls in such a way that it could last infinitely without it repeating itself. And this is on display in Trinity Boy Wolf in London. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides to all the <coughs> piece itself. We're interested in, you know, this, this, this thing about the moment of capture, the moment of the event, that you can predict an event happening, um, that you're, you're never quite certain that it's going to happen. But causality can only ever be attributed after the event has happened. 
So you can only really say that, that this, this thing is causal post facto. Up to that point, it's only ever probability, it's only ever certain possibility. Yeah? But um, time does not, that, that thing doesn't flow both ways. And I love the asymmetry of that. Um, and so on and so on. Photography has become increasingly gamified. So there are plenty of um, online resources. And as a photography teacher, um, I've gradually been made redundant by various you know, online resources which are um, promising people rewards for learning photography online. The moment a capture is problematic, the moment you decide that the image is sufficient to make a difference, yeah? Um, we, we, we started, I think, the least interesting thing about photography, if you talk about general photography, is the moment of capture, yeah? So having set some complicated thing in process, which is going to make something that doesn't look very much like a photograph, you then, if you, if you just decide to press the button and do a screenshot at that point, you're doing something which is very much like a traditional photographer does, but you're not really thinking about how that landscape is produced. So we decided to remove the element of capture from our project completely, and just generate a process that gets people to behave like photographers. So we built this landscape, and it's generative. It's built in, <coughs> built in unity. It randomly populates a rotating sphere with trees, fronds, objects, rocks, which are all assets which are required uh, from resources you can find online. Um, and it spins around, and the time of day changes, and the lighting changes entirely random, entirely generatively. Now, we could have just left it at that, thought, right, we're going to do what uh, Gareth Damien Martin has done, and photograph this generative landscape. But we thought, what if we tried to make it so that you have to actually creep up on it and stalk it? So as a photographer, if you're hunting um, an animal through a forest or through a, uh, a landscape, you know, you're, you're trying to get the perfect shot, but it's more interesting what the what the landscape has got you to do, the way it made you behave. And if you think back to um, Alan's piece about city workers, he's talking about how the city makes people use their bodies in a certain way. It's how technologies and more than technology, the way technology is integrated with culture, causes us to, to react and behave in a certain way. So we're trying to get the interactors with this game or the players to behave like photographers, but we don't care whether they ever get a picture or not because that's not important. The machine next door that you see has got sensors that can detect whether you're um, looking at it, it's got facial recognition, and it's got a proximity sensor, which is an ultrasonic rangefinder which spins around and it can tell how close you are to it. And as you approach it, it knows you're creeping up on it. And at that point, it won't reveal itself to you, it will hide from you, it won't display the contents of this um, landscape that it's showing you. Um, so, as with technology, it's hideously dodgy. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to cut to a video of this thing in action, because then you can see what it does. And this is a promo video that I'm going to do. It's crazy how much the frame rate I'm going to cut to the end. This, this so, if you are perfectly still, the um, The landscape stops spinning. Okay. <laughs> and then a cat emerges from the, from the undergrowth, and, you, and then the camera zooms in, and you actually see this animal there. But the idea, of, the idea, of, you know, we were kind of discussing this in preparation. And we thought, what if we get created it to such a level of sophistication that you could never actually creep up on it without it detecting you? So the idea came about of having this 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 game, which is almost impossible to um, approach. You know, the aim is that you've got to try and creep up on this thing and it will, it will sort of respond to you um, if you're not there. So your absence will make something happen. And we really like that idea because I think the way digital technology pushes them to be frantically active all the time and the, the sheer destructivity of that, you know, if you have to create something that 
that required you to be absent or to do less or to just relax or just to not be present in that space would be quite perverse, but I think really truthful. I think one of the things we really want to do with this is to throw the experience back into the room. So the action's not on the screen. The screen's an object. It's, it's, a, it's something that creates function. Really. But, you know, you, you have to really sort of be in meat space to get the point of what this thing is. So it throws that responsibility for action back to you in that embodied space that you're in. It's a kind of anti, it's a provocative piece of work, which is against this immersion that Sarah Jones sort of talked about at the beginning. It's a kind of absolute repost to all that stuff where we are trying to create something that subverts itself at this point because there's a need for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's going to have to be the quickest of questions. One word questions, one word answers. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Vincent. Uh, well, it's not really maybe a question so much as a comment. I, I quite like that, that thing you're talking about at the end there, especially because like most of our engagements with digital technology are about wanting us, it's always asking us to do more, yeah. you know, so yeah. that we provide more data and it can collect more about us. So I like this idea that it's the absence that makes something happen. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. There you go, that was quick. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Another quick one? I'll have the thing set up, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get it up and running, so if anybody wants to get out of the bed and there over the day. Thank you very much, Francis. things that I think is really interesting in the world of, should we say, immersion, uh, and obviously VR computers. Um, so I'm John, I should do that bit right. I'm a real world game designer. Yes, that is my actual job, what pay me to do. Um, and so I used to be a triple A game developer, I used to work in Xbox and PlayStation games a long, long time ago. I taught people how to make games. Um, since about 2010, I've made games that take place in public spaces, so giant games and all different sizes and types. Nearly always in technology. So, uh, Half an hour, right? Half an hour in a very warm room before lunch. <laughs> uh, so, um, so trying to talk about the things that I do over the last 20 years, I've had uh, sort of three areas of my career. One was working in what I would call the games industry proper, so AAA games for kind of large scale publishers. I had my own company that made uh, iPhone games and digital download games. Uh, I ran a degree course at the University of Derby, so that was kind of one games industry proper. Then uh, I went into the world of uh, making giant games for public spaces, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. And that was very much a startup that I travelled the world with. Um, I'm not doing that anymore, so that will tell you, I guess, that it wasn't a massive success. So there's a big story behind that. Um, and then in the last four years, I've had a company called Museum Games, which is a much simpler way to explain the kind of things that I do. I make games and playful things for cultural spaces. Uh, and some of those uh, are what some of the partners up here, and including one that <laughs> I'm sure you can guess those. It's not being streamed, is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, um, so the things that are kind of that I normally get paid for are stuff for museums and other cultural spaces. But there's this kind of crossover now where I build things in a kind of artistic space. So that's kind of escape games, immersive theatre, those kind of things. I'm going to show you some of the stuff that I do in that world. Um, so, uh, so I think probably Phil has mentioned some of the touch table stuff that we've done together, maybe. Um, so we've built giant touch table things, which I'm really interested in because it's about large collaborative spaces. Um, Renga is this giant game that I kind of mentioned in passing. It's a 500 player game uh, for public spaces that's, that's held in somewhere like a theatre or an outdoor space like a car park with a giant screen. So 500 players come, we give them laser pointers, they have to self-organise, it takes about 90 minutes. It's a crazy experience that we, you can see we did it in some of the places. And then I was trying to rack my brains for all of the kind of VR stuff, since this is a VR conference, so I'm going to show you all the VR things that I've done. Um, and this is a project uh, we're going to talk about more in a minute. We've actually built at the University of Birmingham, weirdly. I was a contractor here for three years. Um, 
as you other crazy things. So this is in the corporate training and gaming world. Um, so I work with companies that run giant gaming events for hundreds of people, normally with enormous budgets, but we take over hotels or castles, or we did one in a prison last weekend. Um, and this is a game that sits within that kind of larger game. So it's often we do a game where it's kind of two or three games with actors and everything involved, immersive experiences, people stay overnight. Um, but it's a corporate training experience, so they're doing puzzles that are kind of related to their work. So the serious games question from early on is kind of related to that. Uh, and this is a game that's a, I would call it the kind of next step of escape games. So this is combining uh, the kind of things that people do in escape games, the kind of things that people do in board games. It's a hybrid board game, video game. Um, and this is now being used um, by a company that I work for in the corporate training world. They've actually used this um, in job interviews. So they've actually got people to kind of play the game and then kind of use that as a way of assessing them. Because you learn an awful lot about people by how they, about how, how they work in teams and games. And, work um, and this is a game that I've got at the moment on tour. Uh, this is a piece of immersive theatre. Uh, it's for 24 players. And I'm going to hopefully talk about this a bit more later on. Um, but it's a game that is set in a car park where the players are spies. And during the game, you come in and you get a ticket as a group, um, and that means that you get access to a car. So you're in a car, in a car park on a live stage out of the sky. So we'll come back to that one. Um, but it is, it is touring for those, so you can see it. Um, anyway, so all the stuff that I make kind of fits into this group of things. Um, I sit, the stuff that I make sits in between some of my theatre games and tech. I'm a software engineer from a long way back. Um, I made games, and that's how I learned, <coughs> learn really. And I match that with theatre. So I'm, I've been in a kind of smaller minority of people that have worked in the games world and have then gone into theatrical spaces. We've seen a lot more people come from the theatre world and making their things more game-like. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of a bit unusual in that respect. And so it combines all these things, right? Real spaces, physical interactions with other people, and control of stories or non-linear storytelling of some kind. Uh, these are some of the buildings that I've got my stuff in, um, uh, from National Trust Properties, Castles to science centers for libraries. And so I get to work in cool places, which is kind of nice. And if you take nothing else from my talk today, I'm hoping there's other things you do take, but when I build things for the museum sector, the cultural sector, um, where possible, I try and do a kind of free cut down tutorial of it. So on my website, you go to drmuseum.tech, there's I think about nine of these. There's even one on VR, which is massively out of date now, so you might laugh at it if you see it. But these are ways that museums can build interactives without employing people like me. Um, so I get emails from all over the world, which is really nice, where people have used this stuff to put things in their spaces and their galleries. Um, this one is really popular. In fact, touch really popular. And the Babylon Beasts, which is audio tour guides, that's really popular. Digital tour guides. So yeah, so all that stuff's free. It's all Creative Commons. So you know, use it uh, as much as you like. Um, remix it, make money off it, and you can tell me about that. Uh, okay, so my connections with VR. Um, so I'm trying to go back in time. I don't know how how far back everyone else's connections with VR are. So you know, I was uh, what am I now? I'm 41. So I was uh, a young teenager in the early 90s, which was the kind of first wave of the kind of out of home experiences with VR. Perhaps some of the people in this room also experienced that and kind of perhaps have worked with it. So these are my kind of connections with it. Um, there was a company called Virtuality that appeared in 1993, uh, and they built a, a whole range of these. Only anyone nodding in the room? Does anyone remember this stuff? Anyone play this stuff? Yeah, okay, there's a couple of people. So this, this was the kind of first wave of this kind of thing going into theme parks. Back then, when we still had arcades were a big thing, you know, people went out and they put their 20p in the machine and played games. This was the kind of VR of the arcade world. And these are actually hugely popular. The company behind it I mean, sold, I think, 60 or 70,000 of these around the world. In various incarnations, some will sit down. So this is this is the one that I played out of their ten different titles, Flying Aces. And I think I played it either at Thorpe Park or or maybe at Towers. You know, you have four of these connected together. So I didn't work on any of these. This was kind of some of my inspiration. Um, does anyone recognise this this TV show? I'm really on my own this one, I guess. <laughs> yeah, a couple of people, right? So this was a, a very short-lived single season uh, show that appeared on BBC. Um, cre created by the same group, Nightmare, which is more of a kind of touch game of experience, but a slightly older age group. Um, so, following on that pattern of having somebody you know, in a virtual world like with Nightmare, and then having other people kind of control them. And I've got videos of this with me if people want to see the whole video, it's on YouTube. 
I mean, it's, it shows you, I mean, how much people were into it, but also how bad it was, right? Because that was the thing with the error, it's terrible, that one. I mean, the frame rate, I mean, you can see that the rate rate is obviously really low, and this isn't so far away from PlayStation 1 era, so we know how much better graphics we are. But I mean, the frame rate of this is like three or four frames a second. And in order to make this thing move, this guy is like doing this one touch pad to me. So, I mean, it, it did work, and, and in fact, some of these things, as we know, kind of cause more damage than they did good. Um, and then this is some of my favorite kind of game shop. This is Epcot, so uh, I once got to go on a fantastic family holiday to Disney, um, and in, I didn't go in 94, but apparently this ride started in 94. So this was their mock-up. This was from their r and lab, the Imagineering Labs, um, and they invited people into playing. So I mean, they were really, it was really cutting edge VR when put this kind of stuff together. They had banks and banks of silicon graphics machines, if that means anything. Kind of back when computers were like the size of fridges, rooms and rooms of them. Um, and what they had is they, they didn't quite know where they were going with it, with Disney, but at Epcot, they had a ride they built, which was this kind of magic carpet, a landing ride, and they invited people to go on it. So I was fortunate enough that I got to ride that and experience it um, back then. So, uh, so perhaps these, all these things kind of influence my guess a bit in the kind of things I want to do. Um, so, uh, things that I actually made in, in VR, and I mean, they're not amazing, I'm afraid, but I wanted to share them with you anyway. Um, so, uh, I did my undergraduate and postgraduate at Manchester University um, in computer science, and I was doing some, uh, you know, as well as games, the other thing I love is football, so obviously what do you do when you do a football team? You try and combine all of the things you love at once. So I was doing football analysis using computers, and there's a simulation league called Rugby Cup, um, and so I was doing two things. I was doing work in this simulation world, and I was doing work analysing Premier League video streams. So the idea of kind of taking uh, the video footage from the Premier League and doing analysis on it, which I mean, it's all, it's all happened now, but I mean, this was 1999, 2000, years ago. Um, and there's no, fortunately, I think, there's no, there's no videos of this or no images of what it actually looked like, um, but at Manchester we had access to, you know, the same technology that I mentioned that Disney had, these kind of huge machines that sort of graphics had, and access to a cave, right? I mean, back, back then these were all the rage, and they've sort of, as with all VR, these things have come and gone and come and gone repeatedly. We had access to this, it was probably millions of pounds worth of kit. And so I took my, my 3D view, which again, I couldn't find images for, but I just give you an idea of what it would look like. We had players playing football, um, it was all rendered in a, in a lovely, uh, had a, a Wembley Stadium uh, 3D model that it all played in, and you'd go into the cave, you could wear 3D glass, you could sit there, and you could watch football matches, which I'd scanned from live football matches, and then were showing in a viewer. You know, this is a long time ago. I mean, it didn't sound that exciting, um, but I, mean, I quite enjoyed doing it. But eventually, I dropped out of my PhD, so um, it wasn't that much. Um, so then, anyway, so I do that stuff in VR and co connected with VR. Then I ran off and worked in the games industry for people like Codemasters. Um, I launched a games degree at the University of Derby. This is me giving a lecture in Second Life. So I guess that's sort of a connection to this stuff. We were the first university, to, uh, because my connection from working in the games industry, we were the first university to buy an island in Second Life back in 2004, and I made a load of iPhone games with it as well. Okay, so then, so I, yeah, so clearly there's a big gap where I went and did things in the games industry proper and taught at university. Uh, meanwhile, obviously, we know all about the kind of reboot of, of, uh, of the Alphans and this guy, Palmer Lucky, who in, I think, 20. In the summer of 2012, he did his Kickstarter, and he had, he he started all of this right because he collected all of those bits of kit that we talked about, those kind of crazy VR headsets from Silicon Graphics and all of that stuff from the 90s. He was collecting all of that, and even at the age of like 15 or 16, right, he was kind of playing with that, and eventually decided that he was going to be the the person that kind of relaunched it through his Kickstarter. You know, hugely popular. I think at the time it was the most popular <coughs> Kickstarter, and I'm sure we all know the story that Facebook bought them for. Two billion or maybe three billion dollars, depending on what you're doing. Okay, so, um, so then all of a sudden these headsets are back on the market, right? So you're able to get these for much cheaper amounts. And as we've seen from some of the talks, uh, people have been playing this stuff for quite a while now. This is five, five years ago since they were available. So I was doing some contract work, and this is where me and Phil first met actually, was over at the Digital Humanities Hub, which I would point, but I can't tell which direction now. Mm -hmm. that way. It doesn't exist anymore, right? But the room is still there. Um, I'm sure some of you may have been into this room at some point. Perhaps not. Yeah, a couple of nods. Um, so this was this amazing space that we had for doing kind of digital humanities research. 
and we had these kind of crazy giant touch tables, um, we had this ridiculously huge 4K screen, uh, which cost about 250 grand, um, touch screens all around the room, and we had another thing that really was going underused, so you can't see it very clearly, but on the top, on the ceiling, on these mounts, are tracking cameras. So some people might come across Vicon tracking, tra tracking cameras. So they're the ones that are usually used in, uh, in TV and film to kind of motion capture. So normally you'd have loads of those around the space to kind of capture everybody movement. We'd be using them to capture people's general position. So you can see here's my old buddy Chris wearing uh, glasses with the tracking balls on. That's me. I mean, we're doing some kind of fake staged photo shoot, right? So I don't know what I'm doing, but it looks like I'm using a tablet of some kind. But I've got the same markers on. So this system was going massively underused. You know, this is a few hundred grand's worth of cameras on the ceiling. Uh, we had access to the to the uh, DK1, I think at that time, the Oculus Rift thing. And as you can see, this is a fairly large space, like 10 by 20 meters or something. <coughs> it's a tracked area. So even when people started to do the kind of small scale uh, vibe tracking, it was kind of a few meters square. This was a massive space. So. I was like, okay, I'm in academia, I can do crazy stuff, so let's do some crazy stuff. Um, so put those two things together, right? The Oculus Rift, which doesn't have external tracking at that point, and these Vicon tra tracking cameras, which we've got 30. Um, and my job then was to kind of help uh, businesses around Birmingham who were kind of interested in this, this kind of using this kind of technologies. And so I worked on a business assist with a, with a company locally, and we were trying to do this. There's a, I mean, there's a TV program about this now, you might have seen called Your Home Made Perfect, right? And the whole point is they do a kind of uh, renovation of your house, um, but before they do that, they do it all in VR, you put the headset on, and you get to experience it. So we were kind of doing a kind of mock-up of that kind of thing, but five or six years ago. So the idea that, you know, we could do a, we could plan out your kitchen all the way around here, we could stick a few people, put some headsets on, and you could physically walk around your kitchen, right? You couldn't bump into anything, but you could see the whole space. Um, that was the kind of idea behind the, behind the, the assist and we did a few mock-ups of that, but obviously I'm a games person. I mean, I'm not going to stop there, am I? Um, so, I mean, I, again, I don't have any good clips of this, but uh, this is the kind of setup, and you would have seen this a number of times since, because this, I mean, this was, I mean, it's quite a good idea, right? These people have done it since, and loads of people, people have been at the time. So you've got your, your Oculus with headset on, you've got a hat with the markers on, and you've got a backpack with the tech on it. And that's talking to a load of kind of bike and tracking and this was the mock-up we were originally given for the room in Unity, I think that was, a long time ago. Um, so that was our very first one, so to let you walk around the room, and the doors were all at the same point, so in the, in the virtual space, when you touch a door handle, you know, it's there in the real space as well. And it, I mean, it's really powerful when that happens. Um, so then, obviously, the next thing I'm going to do is marry that with uh, game technology. So this is a Nintendo Wii controller, um, and obviously you can see it's a gun, and normally you put the Wii remote what I've done is I've taken one of those sets of glasses and kind of mounted, mounted them on top in a certain pattern. Um, and then this also talks over Bluetooth. So when you pull the trigger and you reload it, all the artworks, um, there you go, there's me, lovely modeling the setup. So uh, without the VR headset on, but the idea of the, uh, the cap and the gun with the markers on. And what you'll see on the wall behind are the green bits of the cameras and the yellow bits are the two things we can, that we usually can see. Um, and then I married that with you know, the gaming of the day, which was that was a kind of a zombie shooter for Left 4 Dead. So this was an idea you could play a real Left 4 Dead, and zombies would come running out of the doors and you could shoot them, right? And it was a, it was a good idea, but it never kind of went anywhere because it was in academia and it wasn't really part of my job. So, uh, so obviously we've seen this go on. I'm, sh I'm sure many people have come across these things. So since, since then, there was a, a, there's been some other academic work, but also, I mean, the Void have been hugely successful at doing this. I mean, you, you can watch these videos of them, you know, this is, this is them doing it in 2016, and you can see it's the same setup, right? It's the same headsets, it's the same tracking markers that we use. And so they've converted this into a commercial operation. And it's hugely successful. Disney have got a whole bunch of these rides now, based off the back of that, around Star Wars franchises and real life Ghostbusters. Uh, IMAX did a similar thing, and again, you can see the same setup, right? Um, they, they started theirs in 2016 as well. But I've since shut down. They shut down at the end of last year. It was a bit of a shame, but maybe, maybe not the big success story 
Yeah, but obviously I had the money to kind of do that thing. Um, so then I've not made a load of VR stuff um, since then, so I'm going to talk about some other things that are kind of related. But I think it shows these ideas just kind of, they come around again and again, right? And as the technology gets cheaper, we can kind of revisit them. So, um, so I get some of my money from working for corporate clients in the cultural sectors, building things for them, games and whatever. And some of the money that I get to crazy stuff comes from the arts world. <coughs> and it's almost like a bit of a, a running joke at the moment in the arts world, and it has been for a, maybe a couple of years. It's almost impossible to get money if you don't include VR, AR, or some kind of cross-mixed media version of it. Um, so it's been kind of frustrating for a few years, not wanting to make VR stuff, and kind of realizing that all the money is there to make it wrong. So maybe I should have done this talk a while ago, and then I'd have been more excited about VR and a little bit more, more thought. Um, so I don't think that, I mean, I'm going to just gloss over this point for now, but I mean, AR is, is going to be a success, already is a success. Um, and you know, the hundreds of million, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that is worth in the next couple of years, all of that seems to be coming through. Um, I'm sure people in this room have tried to follow them. Motion, sorry. That's what I'm doing. Magic. Yeah, so I'm right. Good. Um, so then I made stuff in AR. This is a thing that I made quite recently. In a sequence of Queenswood, which is over in Hereford. Um, and again, using your phone as the kind of device for AR. Um, so going to particular locations and having content appear in those locations is a, you know, it's a kind of a, a running theme with a lot of things. You know, it's, it's a Pokemon Go style experience. So this is, you you know, you follow instructions. You, I mean, this is like a lock of version. Debug messages on the screen, but the idea that you go to a certain place in the woods, and when you get there, you get to meet characters, and you get videos, and you get audio, and you meet, and the story kind of unfolds that way. You know, that's a nice thing to do. It's quite easy to do, you know, relatively speaking. And obviously, it uses people's phones. Um, for me, it's a shared experience, um, which is also a, an important thing for the things that I make. Bringing people together to have that experience, I think, is uh, very interesting compared with VR headsets, which is quite exclusive. It's um, and I've also built stuff, and I, I've always included this in the category of AR. So, I, I mean, augmented reality to most people, I think when they initially see it, it's about holding up your phone and like a dinosaur pops out of your desk or whatever. Those are the kind of things that we saw, a lot of that kind of digital stuff. But for me, audio, I think, is really important. I, I use this a lot. A lot of when you're walking around in the real world and you get augmented audio. Um, and I think that. The things that I make that's really powerful because it means you're still connected with the real world, but you've got this kind of overlay there, um, and it's not through a screen. So you can keep your phone in your pocket um, if you want to, or you can have a shared device that you listen to, or you can use phone conductive technology so that your ears are still free. Um, so there's two versions of this. Um, one was done for historic royal palaces, that's nice and thought in the background. This was a mock-up for them, a prototype game, which Farmer George's Block. Um, and it was a family game that lasted about 45 minutes. And each, each team uh, was given a sheet. What sheet was it? It wasn't called Sean, I remember that much. Um, <laughs> anyway, you carry your sheep around with you. Your sheep is your game controller. So where you carry it in the world, the sheep knows where it is. And that's what makes decisions in the game. So if you, if you carry your sheep to a character, to, a, to another uh, statue, in this case it would be, it would know you're walking towards that statue. It would comment on the fact you were doing that, doing that, and then when you got there, you get some kind of that would be your decision point in the storyline. Um, so it was a kind of yeah, it was a kind of Disney-esque story of you saving the flock, and it was all based in real history. So um, sheep were merino sheep were raised in Hampton Court Palace, so it was all tied in with that kind of real stories. Um, and if you want to build this stuff, this is the kind of free DIY version that I do quite a lot for kids. Um, so there's a load of stuff you can just kind of download. You can do this on any uh, Android uh, phone with NFC, this is the Nintendo Communication Technology, um, and you can run your own version of it. That's the kind of budget version. This one, you know, was a custom app that was built. We had actors come in and voice the characters. Um, so, uh, so then the question is this kind of stuff, right? This is, this is, these are the pictures we see uh, again and again of VR and how amazing it's going to be. I mean, this is sort of like everything that's wrong, I guess, with VR. You know, obviously, these people are having a great time. You know, they've all got their copies. They've got their check shirts. Uh, this one's got a didgeridoo. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly, it's all great, right? But the, for me, the problem.
problem is, this is the kind of mixed reality, that dual reality. There's one person who's in the experience, right, who's trying to be involved in it. She doesn't appear to have headphones on, so she's not completely immersed in it. And then everyone else, they're not quiet, are they? They're, they're kind of talking. So this, this problem of how can you possibly be immersed in a thing when you're in the two realities simultaneously. Um, and I think that that is a problem for the kind of experience that we make. And some of the things I'll show you kind of address this more. But, but that, that's always been a problem for me. Like, it's so final, right? When you put your headset on, you're making such a decision. But it's not just a decision to do this, it's a decision to not do all of the other things. You know, if I sit and watch a film at home, I've still got my phone open so I can look at it. I can still, you know, pop out of the room or do other things. I, you know, there's a reason that people go to places like the cinema because it kind of closes all of that stuff off, I'm sure. But a headset is quite final and it's quite uh, singular. And there are more stuff that's addressing this. I think that's one of the problems. Um, I mean, this, this is stuff that we're doing, right? We don't have the killer app yet, which is the kind of classic thing. We've got lots of things that are good that are out there, but the, none of these are the kind of the must have thing that are going to make people rush out and buy it. Um, and we are seeing better sales figures, right? So there is a, a slight increase in this world. And so the most popular uh, VR device is the PSVR, which sells, sells about two million a year, we think. Um, I mean, that's to a kind of gamer audience because you need a PlayStation to kind of run that. Two million sounds like a large number. Does anyone want to guess how many iPhones are sold every year? One, two million. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, for the last five years, they've sold over 220 million. And they're not even the biggest. Sorry, did you get that right? Yes. Well done. <laughs> well done. Uh, but they're not even the biggest. They're not even the biggest manufacturer of phones anymore. Right? So that's Samsung. But you know, this is a very premium experience that people are willing to pay many, many hundreds of pounds for. So I kind of feel like it's in the category. But you get, you get the right idea, right? Um, we're selling some of these, but not many. And it hasn't had the massive success that kind of relates to the the Facebook two, three billion dollar. This is the sales pitch of, of what VR is. You know, it is the holodeck in your home. But of course it isn't. Like, you can't do the stuff you can do in the holodeck uh, in VR in your home. Although when I type, when I decide on that as the kind of title for my uh, for this slide, I put that into Google, this is the picture that comes up. Uh, and apparently this company claims they can do that, surprisingly. So <laughs> whoever they are, I've, I've cropped off the name now. And I put them up for you next time. So when I said, obviously, you can't have the holodeck, they were like, you definitely can. <laughs> Um, so, so when I started doing the kind of uh, out of home experiences, as we call them, in 2010, this was really what I was kind of latching onto. This kind of desire for people to get out of the home to have more kind of shared experiences when they weren't passive, when they were doing something. Um, and in my world, we've seen an enormous growth in kind of immersive theatre. But again, that's quite a niche thing. The kind of punch drunk and secret cinema. Those things sell out massively in London, but that's not kind of mainstream across the whole country. Uh, we're seeing reasonable, reasonably good growth in things like escape games. You know, there's 1,500 escape rooms in the country, and that's kind of, like it's a, it's a time that most people are kind of familiar with, at least. Um, and so, of the things, so, so we already know that VR's got some problems, but the things that I care about in my experiences are things like uh, having, being able to do proper collaboration with people, having eye contact, being able to reach the body language, and these things are still very hard to do in VR. Um, so I'm just going to show you one project um, in a bit more detail. And you can come and see this, which is kind of nice. Uh, it's been to uh, Birmingham already, it's been to London already, um, and we're going to go on tour to a few other places. It goes to Stockton on Tees next to the Riverside uh, Festival, if anyone knows the, in the International Riverside Festival. And tickets are free, amazingly, so uh, definitely come and see this. Um, and these are the people that are in whether we all kind of cross over <laughs> what we do. So the experience um, is virtual in some respects. It's not a VR headset, but it's, it has virtual elements to it. So it's a 90 minute experience. The, there's 24 players. They're separated up into teams in six cars. Um, there are four live actors that populate the space. And there are, depending on who you interact with, there are up to 15 virtual characters that you can interact with. Um, this is the story. Essentially, we've got this guy, he's our politician. Uh, we started this project about four or five years ago and wrote the story long before the crazy uh, politics of recent times. And it's amazing how much we've kind of fallen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit worrying. 
Um, so, so he's our politician. Um, he's on this kind of meteoric rise. He's trying to do this good thing. He's trying to create this climate change bill. And he's got the kind of buying cross party. So things are kind of going well. But obviously, as with most politicians who are successful in somewhere or another, they've got some dodgy past and some, uh, some things in there behind the scenes they might not want to come out. So our role, as we work at MI5, we're investigating into him and what he's doing. So he is here. Let's say we're doing the show today. He's here. We know that he's going to do his press conference in 90 minutes. He's going to announce some new deal with Toy Howe, which is a which is a car company. Um, so what we've got is we're going to investigate over that 90 minutes. We know that he's got a meeting plan in the car park. We've got some kind of information. So we're all going to go and stay here. That car park. That's our plan. Um, this is what it looks like. These are some really old pictures. I'm afraid, but I've got some new ones in a second. So the game is split up into the classic uh, three-act structure. I'm sorry, you're only getting the kind of two-minute so you get a briefing about what you're doing. You are MI5 spies. You're going to investigate Michael. He's meeting in the car park. These are our suspicions of what he's up to. Uh, you then spend the next 45 minutes in the car park watching for him. And uh, you use a mobile phone. You actually use a newer mobile phone. In the old versions, you used a Nokia, uh, which we love. Uh, but it doesn't work, because no one knows how to use a Nokia phone anymore, which I was surprised about. Um, so then you do this kind of stakeout. You watch what he's up to. That's an opportunity to do kind of escape game style things. Um, but story driven, so you're in interacting with other characters to find out about his life. You come back and you share all the information you've gathered and you make a decision. You make a decision as to whether or not we should destroy Michael's career or we should let him carry on based on the information we've found. Um, and actually, that's, that's bookended slightly by. Um, so before you go into the game, you get to meet Michael. Michael is a politician, he's walking around, he's shaking hands, he's looking you in the eye, he's doing a selfie with you. So you've had that kind of personal connection with him which is really interesting when you then start investigating into his life. Um, and then after you've made your decision, you get to see the outcome, you get to see his future legs. Um, so this is, these are the kind of more modern photos. Um, so uh, this is the briefing room, this is Lily, she's your handler, she's going to look after you. Uh, I think you might recognise one of the people there, that's Sarah uh, Green. Um, so this is you then on the way to the car park. Uh, this is us in the car, watching what's happening, looking through the documents from our i5. Um, contacting other characters. So a lot of your gameplay happens through the mobile phone. You can phone characters, you can text them, you can hack into people's voicemails. So you get a lot of the story through that, all through virtual characters. This is interaction with people in it. And so I try to keep it spoiler free in case anyone does want to come and see it. But this is characters watching. That's Michael and who he's meeting. Kind of blurred out, so you can't tell. Uh, and then you actually intercept a drop. There's a, a dead drop that if you do well, if your team does well, uh, you come back with some information. So then what's, what is interesting in this for me is there's actually six separate stories. So there are six teams in six different cars, and the game is designed so that you see six different things. So as the, as the players, as the actors come around, different scenes happen in different cars. Um, and you investigate six different lines of inquiry, so you end up with six different bits of information. So when you come back into the briefing room and go, yeah, we saw, we saw Michael, and we saw what he was up to, and then someone else would go, uh, no, that's not what we saw, that's not what we saw. And so the idea is, when you come back into the room, everyone's made these assumptions about what he's been up to and what he's been doing. And actually, when you kind of collect that information together, only then can you then kind of make a decision. Um, and that's the kind of wrap-up bit of it. And so the technology behind it kind of makes it all happen, as with all of these things. Twilio is actually the same system you get when you phone up to your bank and you kind of uh, get that kind of uh, type in your account number or tell us your postcode. So we'll kind of reuse that system. Uh, and then this is some of the technology behind the scenes that make that possible in the kind of conversations. So I think I'm going to, uh, let me say this point and then I'll stop. So, um, so in terms of the VR experience that are kind of interesting and actually, uh, a moment of madness made its premiere at Flatback Film Festival. And this is something that I saw at Flatback Film Festival in 2014, and probably I was influenced by it and didn't realize it. So this is a VR story, and there are lots of problems with the production of this, but the, the idea is brilliant, which is you're, you're at a dinner party um, for a family, essentially, um, and everyone has got a headset on, so they're all watching this story. So you're, you're not playing a role, but you're embodying a role. So I might be sitting in the place of the dad or the mum, and I get to watch what happens in the interaction. Um, and it didn't quite work because of the video, but what, what, 
works really well is when you take when you take the headset off and you go, okay, yeah, I know what happened. I was the mum, and this is what happened to me. And he's, you know, why were you so mean to me? And that's, you know, you were the dad, right? You were really mean to me. What was that all about? And actually, what you start to realise is that everybody saw a different story. And so I was the mum, and it turns out I was an alcoholic. But I didn't see that. I was drinking. I had a glass of wine. I had a couple of sips from it. Everyone else saw me, kind of lugging it back like crazy. And so it's really interesting to then realise and have the conversation that actually everything saw something different. Um, so I'm going to skip the wrap-up because I'm out of time, right? Okay, so if anyone wants to see the wrap-up, you can come and speak to me afterwards. Mm -hmm. But there's some exciting things that are happening that aren't mine. Um, let me jump forward to one slide, and then I'll let you go to lunch. Um, so uh, you can contact me on Twitter or on my website. Uh, all of those free tutorials are here. If you want a copy of those slides, they're all available there, including the exclusive Never Seen Before wrap-up <laughs> um, covers the bits I can talk about. So if you just go to bit.ly, cover there's game geographies of gaming and VR. John. <laughs> go to that and you can have the slides as well. Okay. Thank you. This is two minute quick fire, no questions, although um, uh, any discussion obviously can be held throughout the rest of the afternoon. We've got tea a little bit later on as well after the uh, first of the workshop sessions. Uh, so I would like to welcome first of all uh, Nick Rashkuta. Uh, and his talk is on. But we'll find out when he gets to switch. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, digital landscape. So I wanted to use this basically as an opportunity um, uh, to just dump a bunch of ideas on the floor. I'm going to write this up into a fellowship or grant proposal sometime over the summer, so I'm interested in any feedback anyone's got, any thoughts, especially if they think anyone's already done this, right, I want to read it. Um, I wanted to start with a story, I'm an ethnographer, I like telling stories, I don't think I have time, but like, so the context of this is um, some uh, ethnographic work in Chernobyl, I've been recently been writing and thinking about uh, phenomenologies and post-phenomenologies of radiation, I will come back to how that is relevant to games in a second. Um, but I'm a landscape geographer, I've background in landscape, and it's very straightforwardly like an obvious kind of subset of games, walking simulators, which are kind of very, very clearly in the traditional landscape tropes of like ruination, wilderness, morality, these kinds of things. So the projects around this, right? Like the, you know, the themes of morality, wilderness, ruin, and landscape games. Um, but my approach is this, is really obviously, we can think of games not simply as representations of landscapes, but as landscapes themselves, and therefore as field sites. This isn't anything particular new, this is basically suggesting that you can do ethnography and digital ethnography. I have a background in like, walking methods, um, so I want to do walking methods in digital game landscapes, that's my approach. But what I really want to do is think through like, the post phenomenology of digital landscapes. I'm particularly trying for radiation, I go to uh, feminist philosophy philosophical work from Lisa Rigore and Catherine Vassalou on like a post-phenomenology and phenomenology of light, right? So that's where, I, I, that's my relationship to radiation. And I really want to think through like the materiality, so we talked earlier about like the presencing of games, um, the embodiment of games, those materialities um, which hold together um, digital worlds, digital subjects through which subjects come to be. So I basically want to do a project where I'm going to take um, that kind of, kind of sort of feminist philosophies of light and think through that particular sort of photonic materiality of digital landscapes. So that's kind of where I'm aiming at. I don't know if I, ah, brilliant. Thank you very much for it.
from November up until well, June, I just stopped doing my whole self for my project. I actually went to this church without having time up to me, that jumper. <laughs> um, so yeah, like the the other church in Europe starts at about seven o'clock in case on a Sunday, and then the the other church in America was actually half past twelve on the Monday morning. So that was one of the things I had to stay up really late like that. So that's some good. Um, so essentially. So a lot of the people that actually go to this church are people who are home, homebound and can't get to church in the physical world. So being able to put the headset on means that they can actually have a church community and show their kind of do all their worship and things they want to do, and it's really really good. Um, so yeah, there's a massive community here where they have a Discord channel, which is like a chat thing you can use offline, um, and they will kind of discuss prayer needs and. Um, they have like gaming chats and meeting pages and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, these are the two main problems at the moment, which is there's people coming in causing a lot of abuse, um, which then has to be kicked. And then they have like a whole moderation team to sort that out, but that's the kind he's working on. And tech issues sometimes the pastor can sound like a Dalek or <laughs> could like lag out or you know he does a worship video. Studio practice, um, sort of do this 
faces um, that people are creating games and what they want to reflect out those um, experiences that they have. Um, and what I've found really interesting is this kind of idea of the hegemony, I don't know if you understand that word, um, of play, uh, in that like the people who are controlling the industry um, decide what kind of games and what kind of work um, the businesses that we produce. Um, and also the indie apocalypse, uh, which is the sudden uh, influx of indie games uh, that have suddenly become very uh, commercially viable. Um, but there's just so many of them that they need to pick and borrow from these kind of bigger games um, and kind of twist themselves into a more palatable um, format. So then when I was talking to people um, about what they found like while they were developing, they found that like there was this weird kind of tension between um, soft skills and technical skills. Um, people saying like, oh, I was using game maker, so it's when I was like, you know, 10 or whatever, um, being very, very skilled, but it's the no who that gets you into these places. Um, I found that particularly when I attended events. And then weird like blurring when they start to make these games, and the places that they <coughs> are creating the games and where they delineate like the workspace and their own space and even in the office, um, there are these kind of like spaces for like recreation. Um, it's all just very kind of mixed. Um, and I found that when I decided to make my own game, because I thought, why not kind of reproduce these ideas and how, how do I react to these um, observations I found. So I chose uh, the my games engine, Dreams, uh, which is by Media Mod published by Sony Interactive. It's on the PS4. Uh, this is my first attempt, and I wasn't immediately good at game development, which really annoyed me. Uh, and this is an always man sinking into the floor and like, trying to restart and do it over completely. Um, then, like, using the kind of weird kind of tool set that Dreams has, you use the controller to kind of tilt um, and kind of, you know, pick out things that you want. Um, I created a garden, um, and I thought, wow, that looks really nice. Underneath it, we can see things. Um, and then I started to make a platform game that kind of wanted to like hide these bits, but also give the player something to like kind of do as opposed to just explore this one platform. Um, and also in dreams, they encourage the players or the users to share their assets. Um, and you can go into things and search them um, and find out like which kind of things you want to put in the game. And they all belong to certain other users who are like ranked in terms of like art and interactivity and sounds and so on and so forth. Um, and this is just some progress shots that um, I have. Uh, and I think the next one I'll show you from Menu Bar that is all like controlled with the like motion sensors um, that you can kind of make with bits and pieces, like other assets that you want to make, um, any like film making um, tools or tools. alternative project, like product of my knowledge, um, but once again, like, it's not super accessible to be able to go and use those kind of things. So it's just kind of weird to think about. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. 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 Um, I'm happy to be here because um, I was squeezed in at the last minute by the conference members, mm -hmm. so thanks very much. Um, so, um, I'm from Singapore, and uh, um, over the past uh, uh, 10 years or so, my team and I have been working with uh, schools in Singapore and the region, uh, and just, uh, I'm, I'm a geographer by native profession, just like all of you here, so I thought I'd just focus on the geographical aspects of my work. Um, <clears throat> very quickly, and I'm not really used to using it, because I'll just like hunch. Um, so, basically, 
basically, um, we try to use um, the environments more as uh, canvases of, of learner expression rather than as, uh, as exemplars. So here we start with a uh, blank canvas in 3D. Uh, I'm still from a geographical point of view, the plan view. Um, and then what we do is we allow the students to, like in this case, create their own river basins. And in the, the malleability of the environment allows such things to happen. And as you can see, so I mean, you know, you get like, uh, and, uh, yeah, so you get stuff like this, which um, if you're a geomorphologist, you would see what's wrong with it. Um, um, it it's okay if you don't see what's wrong with it. <laughs> 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 it really means you're not trained in hydrology, which is fine. Okay, but there's something wrong with this. Okay, but I won't insult your intelligence by telling you what. So I used word canvases earlier. So we operate in various environments, such as Minecraft, um, Open Sims, Open Life, and we're also in uh, AR, um, and in Arduino as well. All these platforms were mentioned earlier today. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things, uh, quick slides. So uh, as you, those of you who've been to Singapore, you would know that our landscape does not really look like this, but more like this. And this is a problem if you are trying to teach geography. So what we, basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to allow the students to complement their field work studies with, uh, with, uh, with uh, immersion. Okay, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of VR. Um, yeah, so these are just illustrations. This one is meant to illustrate um, how we've used our immersive environments to help develop their understanding of contour lines because what we did is we get them to see from a plan view as well as from orthogonal view simultaneously, and then we get them, uh, them. And then finally, uh, what they also do is they over, uh, we get the groups to go into the different z-axis uh, z levels and uh, trace, uh, because the affordance of the environment has x, y, z, so they plot x, y on the graph, and then each group has a z, and then they overlay all the z's, and then you get that, which is good. Uh, finally, just a little plug, um, uh, uh, BGL has asked me to uh, helm a special issue on augmented reality. So if any of you are working in AR, and I did hear some of you, uh, I know I didn't interact with any of you, but I, I was keeping my ears to the ground. <laughs> and those of you who are interested in AR, uh, I think this is a terrific opportunity because it's BGL. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you.